Section one of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. The Translator's Preface english writers who have spoken of goethe's doctrine of colours have generally confined their remarks to those parts of the work in which he has undertaken to account for the colours of the prismatic spectrum and of refraction altogether on principles different from the received theories of newton the less questionable merits of the treatise consisting of a well-arranged mass of observations and experiments many of which are important and interesting have thus been in a great measure overlooked the translator aware of the opposition which the theoretical views alluded to have met with intended at first to make a selection of such of the experiments as seem more directly applicable to the theory and practice of painting finding however that the alterations this would have involved would have been incompatible with a clear and connected view of the author's statements he preferred giving the theory itself entire reflecting at the same time that some scientific readers may be curious to hear the author speak for himself even on the points at issue in reviewing the history and progress of his opinions and researches goethe tells us that he first submitted his views to the public in two short essays entitled contributions to optics among the circumstances which he supposes were unfavourable to him on that occasion he mentions the choice of his title observing that by a reference to optics he must have appeared to make pretensions to a knowledge of mathematics a science with which he admits he was very imperfectly acquainted another cause to which he attributes the severe treatment he experienced was his having ventured so openly to question the truth of the established theory but this last provocation could not be owing to mere inadvertence on his part indeed the larger work in which he alludes to these circumstances is still more remarkable for the violence of his objections to the newtonian doctrine there can be no doubt however that much of the opposition goethe met with was to be attributed to the manner as well as to the substance of his statements had he contented himself with merely detailing his experiments and showing their application to the laws of chromatic harmony leaving it to others to reconcile them as they could with the pre-established system or even to doubt in consequence the truth of some of the newtonian conclusions he would have enjoyed the credit he deserved for the accuracy and the utility of his investigations as it was the uncompromising expression of his convictions only exposed him to the resentment or silent neglect of a great portion of the scientific world so that for a time he could not even obtain a fair hearing for the less objectionable or rather highly valuable communications contained in his book a specimen of his manner of alluding to the newtonian theory will be seen in the preface it was quite natural that this spirit should call forth a somewhat vindictive feeling and with it not a little uncandid as well as unsparing criticism the doctrine of colours met with this reception in germany long before it was noticed in england where a milder and fairer treatment could hardly be expected especially at a time when owing perhaps to the limited intercourse with the continent german literature was far less popular than it is at present this last fact it is true can be of little importance in the present instance for although the change of opinion with regard to the genius of an enlightened nation must be acknowledged to be beneficial it is to be hoped there is no fashion in science and the translator begs to state once for all that in advocating the neglected merits of the doctrine of colours he is far from undertaking to defend its imputed errors sufficient time has however now elapsed since the publication of this work in eighteen ten to allow a calmer and more candid examination of its claims 
in this more pleasing task germany has again for some time led the way and many scientific investigators have followed up the hints and observations of goethe with a due acknowledgment of the acuteness of his views it may require more magnanimity in english scientific readers to do justice to the merits of one who was so open and in many respects it is believed so mistaken an opponent of newton but it must be admitted that the statements of goethe contain more useful principles in all that relates to harmony of colour than any that have been derived from the established doctrine it is no derogation of the more important truths of the newtonian theory to say that the views it contains seldom appear in a form calculated for direct application to the arts the principle of contrast so universally exhibited in nature so apparent in the action and reaction of the eye itself is scarcely hinted at the equal pretensions of seven colours as such and the fanciful analogies which their assumed proportions could suggest have rarely found favour with the votaries of taste indeed they have long been abandoned even by scientific authorities and here the translator stops he is quite aware that the defects which make the newtonian theory so little available for ascetic application are far from invalidating its more important conclusions in the opinion of most scientific men in carefully abstaining therefore from any comparison between the two theories in these latter respects he may still be permitted to advocate the clearness and fullness of goethe's experiments the german philosopher reduces the colours to their origin and simplest elements he sees and constantly bears in mind and sometimes ably elucidates the phenomena of contrast and gradation two principles which may be said to make up the artist's world and to constitute the chief elements of beauty these hints occur mostly in what may be called the scientific part of the work on the other hand in the portion expressly devoted to the ascetic application of the doctrine the author seems to have made but an inadequate use of his own principles in that part of the chapter on chemical colours which relates to the colours of plants and animals the same genius and originality which are displayed in the essays on morphology and which have secured to goethe undisputed rank among the investigators of nature are frequently apparent but one of the most interesting features of goethe's theory although it cannot be a recommendation in a scientific point of view is that it contains undoubtedly with very great improvements the general doctrine of the ancients and of the italians at the revival of letters the translator has endeavoured in some notes to point out the connection between the theory and the practice of the italian painters the doctrine of colours as first published in eighteen ten consists of two volumes in octavo and sixteen plates with descriptions in quarto it is divided into three parts a didactic a controversial and an historical part the present translation is confined to the first of these with such extracts from the other two as seemed necessary in fairness to the author to explain some of his statements the polemical and historical parts are frequently alluded to in the preface and elsewhere in the present work but it has not been thought advisable to omit these allusions no alterations whatever seem to have been made by goethe in the didactic portion in later editions but he subsequently wrote an additional chapter on entopic colours expressing his wish that it might be inserted in the theory itself at a particular place which he points out the form of this additional essay is however very different from that of the rest of the work and the translator has therefore merely given some extracts from it in the appendix the polemical portion has been more than once omitted in later editions in the first two parts the author's statements are arranged numerically in the style of bacon's natural history this we are told was for the convenience of reference but many passages are thus separately numbered which hardly seem to have required it the same arrangement is however strictly followed in the translation to facilitate a comparison with the original where it may be desired 
and here the translator observes that although he has sometimes permitted himself to make slight alterations in order to avoid unnecessary repetition or to make the author's meaning clearer he feels that an apology may rather be expected from him for having omitted so little he was scrupulous on this point having once determined to translate the whole treatise partly as before stated from a wish to deal fairly with a controversial writer and partly because many passages not directly bearing on the scientific views are still characteristic of goethe the observations which the translator has ventured to add are inserted in the appendix these observations are chiefly confined to such of the author's opinions and conclusions as have direct reference to the arts they seldom interfere with the scientific propositions even where these have been considered most vulnerable preface to the first edition of eighteen ten it may naturally be asked whether in proposing to treat of colours light itself should not first engage our attention to this we briefly and frankly answer that since so much has already been said on the subject of light it can hardly be desirable to multiply repetitions by again going over the same ground indeed strictly speaking it is useless to attempt to express the nature of a thing abstractedly effects we can perceive and a complete history of those effects would in fact sufficiently define the nature of the thing itself we should try in vain to describe a man's character but let his acts be collected and an idea of the character will be presented to us the colours are acts of light its active and passive modifications thus considered we may expect from them some explanation respecting light itself colours and light it is true stand in the most intimate relation to each other but we should think of both as belonging to nature as a whole for it is nature as a whole which manifests itself by their means in an especial manner to the sense of sight the completeness of nature displays itself to another sense in a similar way let the eye be closed let the sense of hearing be excited and from the lightest breath to the wildest din from the simplest sound to the highest harmony from the most vehement and impassioned cry to the gentlest word of reason still it is nature that speaks and manifests her presence her power her pervading life and the vastness of her relations so that a blind man to whom the infinite visible is denied can still comprehend an infinite vitality by means of another organ and thus as we descend the scale of being nature speaks to other senses to known misunderstood and unknown senses so speaks she with herself and to us in a thousand modes to the attentive observer she is nowhere dead nor silent she has even a secret agent in inflexible matter in a metal the smallest portions of which tell us what is passing in the entire mass however manifold complicated and unintelligible this language may often seem to us yet its elements remain ever the same with light poise and counterpoise nature oscillates within her prescribed limits yet thus arise all the varieties and conditions of the phenomena which are presented to us in space and time infinitely various are the means by which we become acquainted with these general movements and tendencies now as a simple repulsion and attraction now as an unsparkling and vanishing light as undulation in the air as commotion in matter as oxidation and deoxidation but always uniting or separating the great purpose is found to be to excite and promote existence in some form or other the observers of nature finding however that this poise and counterpoise are respectively unequal in effect have endeavoured to represent such a relation in terms they have everywhere remarked and spoken of a greater and lesser principle an action and resistance a doing and suffering an advancing and retiring a violent and moderating power and thus a symbolical language has arisen which from its close analogy may be employed as equivalent to a direct and appropriate terminology 
to apply these designations this language of nature to the subject we have undertaken to enrich and amplify this language by means of the theory of colours and the variety of their phenomena and thus facilitate the communication of higher theoretical views was the principal aim of the present treatise the work itself is divided into three parts the first contains the outline of a theory of colours in this the innumerable cases which present themselves to the observer are collected under certain leading phenomena according to an arrangement which will be explained in the introduction and here it may be remarked that although we have adhered throughout to experiment and thoroughly considered it as our basis yet the theoretical views which led to the arrangement alluded to could not but be stated it is sometimes unreasonably required by persons who do not even themselves attend to such a condition that experimental information should be submitted without any connecting theory to the reader or scholar who is himself to form his conclusions as he may list surely the mere inspection of a subject can profit us but little every act of seeing leads to consideration consideration to reflection reflection to combination and thus it may be said that in every attentive look on nature we already theorize but in order to guard against the possible abuse of this abstract view in order that the practical deductions we look to should be really useful we should theorize without forgetting that we are doing so we should theorize with mental self-possession and to use a bold word with irony in the second part we examine the newtonian theory a theory which by its ascendancy and consideration has hitherto impeded a free inquiry into the phenomena of colours we combat that hypothesis for although it is no longer found available it still retains a traditional authority in the world its real relations to its subject will require to be plainly pointed out the old errors must be cleared away if the theory of colours is not still to remain in the rear of so many other better investigated departments of natural science since however this second part of our work may appear somewhat dry as regards its matter and perhaps too vehement and excited in its manner we may here be permitted to introduce a sort of allegory in a lighter style as a prelude to that graver portion and as some excuse for the earnestness alluded to we compare the newtonian theory of colours to an old castle which was at first constructed by its architect with youthful precipitation it was however gradually enlarged and equipped by him according to the exigencies of time and circumstances and moreover was still further fortified and secured in consequence of feuds and hostile demonstrations the same system was pursued by his successors and heirs their increased wants within the harassing vigilance of their opponents without and various accidents compelled them in some places to build near in others in connection with, with the fabric and thus to extend the original plan it became necessary to connect all these incongruous parts and additions by the strangest galleries halls and passages all damages whether inflicted by the hand of the enemy or the power of time were quickly made good as occasion required they deepened the moats raised the walls and took care there should be no lack of towers battlements and embrasures this care and these exertions gave rise to a prejudice in favour of the great importance of the fortress and still upheld that prejudice although the arts of building and fortification were by this time very much advanced and people had learned to construct much better dwellings and defences in other cases but the old castle was chiefly held in honour because it had never been taken because it had repulsed so many assaults had baffled so many hostile operations and had always preserved its virgin renown this renown this influence lasts even now it occurs to no one that the old castle is become uninhabitable its great duration its costly construction are still constantly spoken of pilgrims wend their way to it hasty sketches of it are shown in all schools and it is thus recommended to the reverence of susceptible youth 
meanwhile the building itself is already abandoned its only inmates are a few invalids who in simple seriousness imagine that they are prepared for war thus there is no reason here respecting a tedious siege or a doubtful war so far from it we find this eighth wonder of the world already nodding to its fall as a deserted piece of antiquity and begin at once without further ceremony to dismantle it from gable and roof downwards that the sun may at last shine into the old nest of rats and owls and exhibit to the eye of the wandering traveller that labyrinthine incongruous style of building with its scanty makeshift contrivances the result of accident and emergency its intentional artifice and clumsy repairs such an inspection will however only be possible when wall after wall arch after arch is demolished the rubbish being at once cleared away as well as it can be to effect this and to level the site where it is possible to do so to arrange the materials thus acquired so that they can be hereafter again employed for a new building is the arduous duty we have undertaken in this second part should we succeed by a cheerful application of all possible ability and dexterity in raising this bastille and in gaining a free space it is thus by no means intended at once to cover the site again and to encumber it with a new structure we propose rather to make use of this area for the purpose of passing in review a pleasing and varied series of illustrative figures the third part is thus devoted to the historical account of early inquirers and investigators as we before expressed the opinion that the history of an individual displays his character so it may here be well affirmed that the history of science is science itself we cannot clearly be aware of what we possess till we have the means of knowing what others possess before us we cannot really and honestly rejoice in the advantages of our own time if we know not how to appreciate the advantages of former periods but it was impossible to write or even to prepare the way for a history of the theory of colours while the newtonian theory existed for no aristocratic presumption has ever looked down on those who were not of its order with such intolerable arrogance as that betrayed by the newtonian school of deciding on all that had been done in earlier times and all that was done around it with disgust and indignation we find priestley in the history of optics like many before and after him dating the success of all researches into the world of colours from the epoch of a decomposed ray of light or what pretended to be so looking down with a supercilious air on the ancient and less modern inquirers who after all have proceeded quietly in the right road and who have transmitted to us observations and thoughts in detail which we can neither arrange better nor conceive more justly we have a right to expect from one who proposes to give the history of any science that he informs us how the phenomena of which he treats were gradually known and what was imagined conjectured assumed or thought respecting them to state all this in due connection is by no means an easy task need we say that to write a history at all is always a hazardous affair with the most honest intention there is always a danger of being dishonest for in such an undertaking a writer tacitly announces at the outset that he means to place some things in light others in shade the author has nevertheless long derived pleasure from the prosecution of his task but it is the intention only that presents itself to the mind as a whole while the execution is generally accomplished portion by portion he is compelled to admit that instead of a history he furnishes only materials for one these materials consist in translations extracts original and borrowed comments hints and notes a collection in short which if not answering all that is required has at least the merit of having been made with earnestness and interest lastly such materials not altogether untouched it is true but still not exhausted may be more satisfactory to the reflecting reader in the state in which they are as he can easily combine them according to his own judgment 
this third part containing the history of the science does not however thus conclude the subject a fourth supplementary portion is added this contains a recapitulation or revision with a view to which chiefly the paragraphs are headed numerically in the execution of a work of this kind some things may be forgotten some are of necessity omitted so as not to distract the attention some can only be arrived at as corollaries and others may require to be exemplified and verified on all these accounts postscripts additions and corrections are indispensable this part contains besides some detached essays for example that on the atmospheric colours for as these are introduced in the theory itself without any classification they are here presented to the mind's eye at one view again if this essay invites the reader to consult nature herself another is intended to recommend the artificial aids of science by circumstantially describing the apparatus which will in future be necessary to assist researches into the theory of colours in conclusion it only remains to speak of the plates which are added at the end of the work and here we confess we are reminded of that incompleteness and imperfection which the present undertaking has in common with all others of its class for as a good play can be in fact only half transmitted to writing a great part of its effect depending on the scene the personal qualities of the actor the powers of his voice the peculiarities of his gestures and even the spirit and favourable humour of the spectators so it is in a still greater degree with a book which treats of the appearances of nature to be enjoyed to be turned to account nature herself must be present to the reader either really or by the help of a lively imagination indeed the author should in such cases communicate his observations orally exhibiting the phenomena he describes as a text in the first instance partly as they appear to us unsought partly as they may be presented by contrivance to serve in particular illustration explanation and description could not then fail to produce a lively impression the plates which generally accompany works like the present are thus a most inadequate substitute for all this a physical phenomenon exhibiting its effect on all sides is not to be arrested in lines nor denoted by a section no one ever dreams of explaining chemical experiments with figures yet it is customary in physical researches nearly allied to these because the object is thus found to be in some degree answered in many cases however such diagrams represent mere notions they are symbolic resources hieroglyphic modes of communication which by degrees assume the place of the phenomena and of nature herself and thus rather hinder than promote true knowledge in the present instance we could not dispense with plates but we have endeavoured so to construct them that they may be confidently referred to for the explanation of the didactic and polemical portions some of these may even be considered as forming part of the apparatus before mentioned we now therefore refer the reader to the work itself first only repeating a request which many an author has already made in vain and which the modern german reader especially so seldom grants si quid novis di rectius istis candidus imperti si non his uteri mecum end of section one section two of theory of colors this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan Rosequist of the Art Monastery Project, www.artmonastery.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Introduction. The desire of knowledge is first stimulated in us when remarkable phenomena attract our attention. In order that this attention be continued, it is necessary that we should feel some interest in exercising it, and thus by degrees we become better acquainted with the object of our curiosity. 
During this process of observation, we remark at first only a vast variety which presses indiscriminately on our view. We are forced to separate, to distinguish, and again to combine, by which means at last a certain order arises which admits of being surveyed with more or less satisfaction. To accomplish this only in a certain degree, in any department, requires an unremitting and close application, and we find for this reason that men prefer substituting a general theoretical view, or some system of explanation, for the facts themselves, instead of taking the trouble to make themselves first acquainted with cases in detail and then constructing a whole. The attempt to describe and class the phenomena of colors has been only twice made first by Theophrastus, and in modern times by Boyle. The pretensions of the present essay to the third place will hardly be disputed. Our historical survey enters into further details. Here we merely observe that in the last century such a classification was not to be thought of, because Newton had based his hypothesis on a phenomenon exhibited in a complicated and secondary state and to this the other cases that forced themselves on the attention were contrived to be referred, when they could not be passed over in silence, just as an astronomer would do if, from whim, he were to place the moon in the center of our system, he would be compelled to make the earth, sun, and planets revolve round the lesser body, and be forced to disguise and gloss over the error of his first assumption by ingenious calculations and plausible statements. In our prefatory observations we assumed the reader to be acquainted with what was known respecting light. Here we assume the same with regard to the eye. We observed that all nature manifests itself by means of colors to the sense of sight. We now assert, extraordinary as it may in some degree appear, that the eye sees no form, inasmuch as light, shade, and color together constitute that which, to our vision, distinguishes object from object, and the parts of an object from each other. From these three, light, shade, and color, we construct the visible world, and thus at the same time make painting possible an art which has the power of producing on a flat surface a much more perfect visible world than the actual one can be. The eye may be said to owe its existence to light, which calls forth, as it were, a sense that is akin to itself. The eye, in short, is formed with reference to light to be fit for the action of light, the light it contains corresponding with the light without. We are here reminded of a significant adage in constant use with the ancient Ionian school, like is only known by like, and again of the words of an old mystic writer which may be thus rendered, if the eye were not sunny, how could we perceive light? If God's own strength lived not in us, how could we delight in divine things? This immediate affinity between light and the eye will be denied by none. To consider them as identical in substance is less easy to comprehend. It will be more intelligible to assert that a dormant light resides in the eye, and that it may be excited by the slightest cause from within or from without. In darkness we can, by an effort of imagination, call up the brightest images. In dreams, objects appear to us as in broad daylight. Awake, the slightest external action of light is perceptible, and if the organ suffers an actual shock, light and colors spring forth. Here, however, those who are wont to proceed according to a certain method may perhaps observe that as yet we have not decidedly explained what color is. This question, like the definition of light and the eye, we would for the present evade, and would appeal to our inquiry itself, where we have circumstantially shown how color is produced. We have only, therefore, to repeat that color is a law of nature in relation with the sense of sight. We must assume, too, that every one has this sense, that every one knows the operation of nature on it, for to a blind man it would be impossible to speak of colors. That we may not, however, appear too anxious to shun such an explanation, we would restate what has been said as follows. Color is an elementary phenomenon in nature adapted to the sense of vision, a phenomenon which, like all others, exhibits itself by separation and contrast, by commixture and union, by augmentation and neutralization, by communication and dissolution. 
Under these general terms, its nature may be best comprehended. We do not press this mode of stating the subject on any one. Those who, like ourselves, find it convenient will readily adopt it, but we have no desire to enter the lists hereafter in its defense. From time immemorial it has been dangerous to treat of color, so much so that one of our predecessors ventured on a certain occasion to say, The ox becomes furious if a red cloth is shown to him, but the philosopher, who speaks of color only in a general way, begins to rave. Nevertheless, if we are to proceed to give some account of our work, to which we have appealed, we must begin by explaining how we have classed the different conditions under which color is produced. We found three modes in which it appears, three classes of colors, or rather, three exhibitions of them all. The distinctions of these classes are easily expressed. Thus, in the first instance, we considered colors as far as they may be said to belong to the eye itself, and to depend on an action and reaction of the organ. Next, they attracted our attention as perceived in, or by means of, colorless mediums. And lastly, where we could consider them as belonging to particular substances. We have denominated the first physiological, the second physical, the third chemical colors. The first are fleeting and not to be arrested. The next are passing, but still for a while enduring. The last may be made permanent for any length of time. Having separated these classes and kept them as distinct as possible, with a view to a clear didactic exposition, we have been enabled at the same time to exhibit them in an unbroken series, to connect the fleeting with the somewhat more enduring, and these again with the permanent hues. And thus, after having carefully attended to a distinct classification in the first instance, to do away with it again, when a larger view was desirable. In a fourth division of our work, we have therefore treated generally what was previously detailed under various particular conditions, and have thus, in fact, given a sketch for a future theory of colors. We will here only anticipate our statements so far as to observe that light and darkness, brightness and obscurity, or if a more general expression is preferred, light and its absence, are necessary to the production of color. Next to the light, a color appears which we call yellow. Another appears next to the darkness, which we name blue. When these, in their purest state, are so mixed that they are exactly equal, they produce a third color called green. Each of the two first-named colors can, however, of itself produce a new tint by being condensed or darkened. They thus acquire a reddish appearance, which can be increased to so great a degree that the original blue or yellow is hardly to be recognized in it. But the intensest and purest red, especially in physical cases, is produced when the two extremes of the yellow-red and blue-red are united. This is the actual state of the appearance and generation of colors. But we can also assume an existing red in addition to the definite existing blue and yellow, and we can produce contrarywise by mixing what we directly produced by augmentation or deepening. With these three or six colors, which may be conveniently included in a circle, the elementary doctrine of colors is alone concerned. All other modifications, which may be extended to infinity, have reference more to the application, have reference to the technical operations of the painter and dyer, and the various purposes of artificial life. To point out another general quality, we may observe that colors throughout are to be considered as half-lights, as half-shadows, on which account, if they are so mixed as reciprocally to destroy their specific hues, a shadowy tint, a gray, is produced. In the fifth division of our inquiry, we had proposed to point out the relations in which we should wish our doctrine of colors to stand to other pursuits. Important as this part of our work is, it is perhaps on this very account not so successful as we could wish. Yet when we reflect that, strictly speaking, these relations cannot be described before they exist, we may console ourselves if we have in some degree failed in endeavoring for the first time to define them. For undoubtedly we should first wait to see how those whom we have endeavored to serve, to whom we have intended to make an agreeable and useful offering, how such persons, we say, will accept the result of our utmost exertion, whether they will adopt it, whether they will make use of it and follow it up, or whether they will repel, reject, and suffer it to remain unassisted and neglected. Meanwhile we venture to express what we believe and hope. From the philosopher we believe we merit thanks for having traced the phenomena of colors to their first sources, 
to the circumstances under which they simply appear and are, and beyond which no further explanation respecting them is possible. It will, besides, be gratifying to him that we have arranged the appearances described in a form that admits of being easily surveyed, even should he not altogether approve of the arrangement itself. The medical practitioner, especially him whose study it is to watch over the organ of sight, to preserve it, to assist its defects, and to cure its disorders, we reckon to make especially our friend. In the chapter on the physiological colors, in the appendix relating to those that are more strictly pathological, he will find himself quite in his own province. We are not without hopes of seeing the physiological phenomena, a hitherto neglected and, we may add, most important branch of the theory of colors, completely investigated through the exertions of those individuals who in our own times are treating this department with success. The investigator of nature should receive us cordially, since we enable him to exhibit the doctrine of colors in the series of other elementary phenomena, and at the same time enable him to make use of corresponding nomenclature, nay, almost the same words and designations as under the other rubrics. It is true we give him rather more trouble as a teacher, for the chapter of colors is not now to be dismissed as heretofore with a few paragraphs and experiments. Nor will the scholar submit to be so scantily entertained as he has hitherto been, without murmuring. On the other hand, an advantage will afterwards arise out of this, for if the Newtonian doctrine was easily learnt, insurmountable difficulties presented themselves in its application. Our theory is perhaps more difficult to comprehend, but once known, all is accomplished, for it carries its application along with it. The chemist who looks upon colors as indications by which he may detect the more secret properties of material things has hitherto found much inconvenience in the denomination and description of colors. Nay, some have been induced after a closer and nicer examination to look upon color as an uncertain and fallacious criterion in chemical operations. Yet we hope by means of our arrangement and the nomenclature before alluded to to bring color again into credit and to awaken the conviction that a progressive, augmenting, mutable quality, a quality which admits of alteration even to inversion, is not fallacious, but rather calculated to bring to light the most delicate operations of nature. In looking a little further round us, we are not without fears that we may fail to satisfy another class of scientific men. By an extraordinary combination of circumstances, the theory of colors has been drawn into the province and before the tribunal of the mathematician, a tribunal to which it cannot be said to be amenable. This was owing to its affinity with the other laws of vision which the mathematician was legitimately called upon to treat. It was owing, again, to another circumstance. A great mathematician had investigated the theory of colors, and having been mistaken in his observations as an experimentalist, he employed the whole force of his talent to give consistency to this mistake. Were both these circumstances considered, all misunderstanding would presently be removed, and the mathematician would willingly cooperate with us, especially in the physical department of the theory. To the practical man, to the dyer, on the other hand, our labor must be altogether acceptable for it was precisely those who reflected on the facts resulting from the operations of dying who were the least satisfied with the old theory. They were the first who perceived the insufficiency of the Newtonian doctrine. The conclusions of men are very different according to the mode in which they approach a science or branch of knowledge, from which side, through which door they enter. The literally practical man, the manufacturer, whose attention is constantly and forcibly called to the facts which occur under his eye, who experiences benefit or detriment from the application of his convictions, to whom loss of time and money is not indifferent, who is desirous of advancing, who aims at equaling or surpassing what others have accomplished, such a person feels the unsoundness and erroneousness of a theory much sooner than a man of letters, in whose eyes words consecrated by authority are at last equivalent to solid coin than the mathematician whose formula always remains infallible even although the foundation on which it is constructed may not square with it again to carry on the figure before employed in entering this theory from the side of painting from the side of aesthetic coloring generally we shall be found to have accomplished a most thankworthy office for the artist in the sixth part we have endeavored to define the effects of color as addressed at once to the eye and mind with a view to making them more available for the purposes of art. 
although much in this portion and indeed throughout has been suffered to remain as a sketch it should be remembered that all theory can in strictness only point out leading principles under the guidance of which practice may proceed with vigor and be enabled to attain legitimate results end of introduction recording by nathan rosequist of the art monastery project www.artmonastery.org Section 3 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan Campbell. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 3. Part 1. Physiological colors. 1. We naturally place these colors first because they belong altogether or in a great degree to the subject, to the eye itself. They are the foundation of the whole doctrine and open to our view the chromatic harmony on which so much difference of opinion has existed. They have been hitherto looked upon as extrinsic and casual, as illusion and infirmity. Their appearances have been known from ancient date, but as they were too evanescent to be arrested, they were banished into the region of phantoms and under this idea have been very variously described. 2. Thus they are called Color Adventici by Boyle, Imaginati Fantastici by Rossetti, by Buffon, Color Accidentale, by Scherfer, Scheinfarben, Apparent Colors, Ocular Illusions and Deceptions of Sight by Many, by Hamburger, Pitia Fugitiva, by Darwin, Ocular Spectra. 3. We have called them physiological because they belong to the eye in a healthy state because we consider them as the necessary conditions of vision, the lively alternating action of which, with reference to external objects and the principle within it, is thus plainly indicated. 4. To these we subjoin the pathological colors, which, like all deviations from a constant law, afford a more complete insight into the nature of the physiological colors. Effects of light and darkness on the eye. 5. The retina, after being acted upon by light or darkness, is found to be in two different states, which are entirely opposed to each other. 6. If we keep the eyes open in a totally dark place, a certain sense of privation is experienced. The organ is abandoned to itself. It retires into itself. That stimulating and grateful contact is wanting by means of which it is connected with the external world and becomes part of a whole. 7. If we look on a white, strongly illumined surface, the eye is dazzled and for time is incapable of distinguishing objects moderately lighted. 8. The whole of the retina is acted on in each of these extreme states, and thus we can only experience one of these effects at a time. In the one case, 6, we found the organ in the utmost relaxation and susceptibility, in the other, 7, in an overstrained state, and scarcely susceptible at all. 9. If we pass suddenly from the one state to the other, even without supposing these to be the extremes, but only, perhaps, a change from bright to dusky, the difference is remarkable, and we find that the effects last for some time. 10. In passing from bright daylight to a dusky place, we distinguish nothing at first. By degrees, the eye recovers its susceptibility, strong eyes sooner than weak ones, the former in a minute, while the latter may require seven or eight minutes. 11. The fact that the eye is not susceptible to faint impressions of light, if we pass from light to comparative darkness, has led to curious mistakes in scientific observations. Thus, an observer, whose eyes required some time to recover their tone, was long under the impression that rotten wood did not emit light at noonday, even in a dark room. The fact was, he did not see the faint light because he was in the habit of passing from bright sunshine to the dark room, and only subsequently remained so long there that the eye had time to recover itself. The same may have happened to Dr. Wall, who, in the daytime, even in a dark room, could hardly perceive the electric light of amber. Our not seeing the stars by day, as well as the improved appearance of pictures seen through a double tube, is also to be attributed to the same cause. 12. If we pass from a totally dark place to one illumined by the sun, we are dazzled. In coming from a lesser degree of darkness to light that is not dazzling, we perceive all objects clearer and better. Hence, eyes that have been in a state of repose are in all cases better able to perceive moderately distinct appearances. Prisoners who have been long confined in darkness acquire so great a susceptibility of the retina that even in the dark, probably a darkness very slightly illumined, they can still distinguish objects. 13. In the act which we call seeing, the retina is at one and the same time in different and even opposite states. 
the greatest brightness, short of dazzling, acts near the greatest darkness. In this state, we at once perceive all the intermediate gradations of chiaroscuro and all the varieties of hues. 14. We will proceed in due order to consider and examine these elements of the visible world, as well as the relation in which the organ itself stands to them, and for this purpose we take the simplest objects. Footnote 1. The German distinction between subject and object is so generally understood and adopted that it is hardly necessary to explain that the subject is the individual, in this case the beholder, the object, all that is without him. End of section 3. Section 4 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan Rosequist of the Art Monastery Project. www.artmonastery.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles East Lake. Part 1, Section 2. Effects of Black and White Objects on the Eye. 15. In the same manner as the retina generally is affected by brightness and darkness, so it is affected by single bright or dark objects. If light and dark produce different results on the whole retina, so black and white objects, seen at the same time, produce the same states together which light and dark occasioned in succession. 16. A dark object appears smaller than a bright one of the same size. Let a white disc be placed on a black ground, and a black disc on a white ground, both being exactly similar in size. Let them be seen together at some distance, and we shall pronounce the last to be about a fifth part smaller than the other. If the black circle be made larger by so much, they will appear equal. 17. Thus, Tycho de Brahe remarked that the moon in conjunction, the darker state, appears about a fifth part smaller than when in opposition, the bright full state. The first crescent appears to belong to a larger disk than the remaining dark portion, which can sometimes be distinguished at the period of the new moon. Black dresses make people appear smaller than light ones. Lights seen behind an edge make an apparent notch in it. A ruler behind which the flame of a light just appears seems to us indented. The rising or setting sun appears to make a notch in the horizon. 18. Black, as the equivalent of darkness, leaves the organ in a state of repose. White, as the representative of light, excites it. We may, perhaps, conclude from the above experiment that the unexcited retina, if left to itself, is drawn together, and occupies a less space than in its active state, produced by the excitement of light. Hence, Kepler says very beautifully, Certum est vel in retina causa pitture, vel in spiritibus causa impressionis, existere dilatationem lucidorum. It is certain that, whether as a retinal image or the impression it makes on our spirit, light has an enlarging quality. This from Paralipomenon in Vitellionum, page 220. Scherfer expresses a similar conjecture. Footnote by Goethe's scientific friend Thomas Johann Siebeck. Leonardo da Vinci observes that a light object relieved on a dark ground appears magnified. And again, Objects seen at a distance appear out of proportion. This is because the light parts transmit their rays to the eye more powerfully than the dark. A woman's white headdress once appeared to me much wider than her shoulders, owing to their being dressed in black. It is now generally admitted that the excitation produced by light is propagated on the retina a little beyond the outline of the image. Professor Plateau of Ghent has devoted a very interesting special memoir to the description and explanation of phenomena of this nature. See his Memoir sur les radiations, published in the eleventh volume of the Transactions of the Royal Academy of Sciences at Brussels. End of footnote. 19. 
However this may be, both impressions derived from such objects remain in the organ itself and last for some time, even when the external cause is removed. In ordinary experience we scarcely notice this, for objects are seldom presented to us which are very strongly relieved from each other, and we avoid looking at those appearances that dazzle the sight. In glancing from one object to another, the succession of images appears to us distinct. We are not aware that some portion of the impression derived from the object first contemplated passes to that which is next looked at. 20. If in the morning, on waking, when the eye is very susceptible, we look intently at the bars of a window relieved against the dawning sky, and then shut our eyes or look towards a totally dark place, we shall see a dark cross on a light ground before us for some time. 21. Every image occupies a certain space on the retina, and of course a greater or less space in proportion as the object is seen near or at a distance. If we shut the eyes immediately after looking at the sun, we shall be surprised to find how small the image it leaves appears. 22. If, on the other hand, we turn the open eye towards the side of a room and consider the visionary image in relation to other objects, we shall always see it larger in proportion to the distance of the surface on which it is thrown. This is easily explained by the laws of perspective, according to which a small object near covers a great one at a distance. 23. The duration of these visionary impressions varies with the powers or structure of the eye in different individuals, just as the time necessary for the recovery of the tone of the retina varies in passing from brightness to darkness. It can be measured by minutes and seconds, indeed much more exactly than it could formerly have been, by causing a lighted linstock to revolve rapidly so as to appear a circle. Footnote by Thomas Johann Siebeck the duration of ocular spectra produced by strongly exciting the retina may be conveniently measured by minutes and seconds, but to ascertain the duration of more evanescent phenomena, recourse must be had to other means. The Chevalier d'Arcy, in Memoirs of the Academy of Science, 1765, endeavored to ascertain the duration of the impression produced by a glowing coal in the following manner. He attached it to the circumference of a wheel, the velocity of which was gradually increased until the apparent trace of the object formed a complete circle, and then measured the duration of the revolution, which was obviously that of the impression. To ascertain the duration of a revolution, it is sufficient merely to know the number of revolutions described in a given time. Recently more refined experiments of the same kind have been made by Professors Plateau and Wheatstone. End footnote. 24 but the force with which an impinging light impresses the eye is especially worthy of attention. The image of the sun lasts longest. Other objects of various degrees of brightness leave the traces of their appearance on the eye for a proportionate time. 25. These images disappear by degrees, and diminish at once in distinctness and in size. 26. They are reduced from the contour inwards, and the impression on some persons has been that in square images the angles become gradually blunted, till at last a diminished round image floats before the eye. 27. Such an image, when its impression is no more observable, can, immediately after, be again revived on the retina by opening and shutting the eye, thus alternately exciting and resting it. 28. Images may remain on the retina in morbid affections of the eye for fourteen, seventeen minutes, or even longer. This indicates extreme weakness of the organ, its inability to recover itself, while visions of persons or things which are the objects of love or aversion indicate the connection between sense and thought. 29. If, while the image of the window bars before mentioned lasts, we look upon a light gray surface. The cross will then appear light and the panes dark. In the first case, the image was like the original picture, so that the visionary impression also could continue unchanged. 
but in the present instance our attention is excited by a contrary effect being produced. Various examples have been given by observers of nature. 30. The scientific men who made observations in the Cordilleras saw a bright appearance round the shadows of their heads on some clouds. This example is a case in point, for while they fixed their eyes on the dark shadow, and at the same time moved from the spot, the compensatory light image appeared to float round the real dark one. If we look at a black disk on a light gray surface, we shall presently, by changing the direction of the eyes in the slightest degree, see a bright halo floating round the dark circle. A similar circumstance happened to myself. For while, as I sat in the open air, I was talking to a man who stood at a little distance from me, relieved on a gray sky, it appeared to me, as I slightly altered the direction of my eyes, after having for some time looked fixedly at him, that his head was encircled with a dazzling light. In the same way, probably, might be explained the circumstance that persons crossing dewy meadows at sunrise see a brightness round each other's heads. The brightness in this case may be also iridescent as the phenomena of refraction come into the account. Thus again it has been asserted that the shadows of a balloon thrown on clouds were bordered with bright and somewhat variegated circles. Beccaria made use of a paper kite in some experiments on electricity. Round his kite appeared a small shining cloud varying in size. The same brightness was even observed round part of the string. Sometimes it disappeared, and if the kite moved faster, the light appeared to float to and fro for a few moments on the place before occupied. This appearance, which could not be explained by those who observed it at the time, was the image which the eye retained of the kite relieved as a dark mass on a bright sky, that image being changed into a light mass on a comparatively dark background. In optical and especially in chromatic experiments, where the observer has to do with bright lights, whether colorless or colored, great care should be taken that the spectrum which the eye retains in consequence of a previous observation does not mix with the succeeding one, and thus affect the distinctness and purity of the impression. 31. These appearances have been explained as follows. That portion of the retina on which the dark cross was impressed is to be considered in a state of repose and susceptibility. On this portion, therefore, the moderately light surface acted in a more lively manner than on the rest of the retina, which had just been impressed with the light through the panes, and which, having thus been excited by a much stronger brightness, could only view the gray surface as a dark. 32. This mode of explanation appears sufficient for the cases in question, but, in the consideration of phenomena hereafter to be adduced, we are forced to trace the effects to higher sources. 33. The eye, after sleep, exhibits its vital elasticity more especially by its tendency to alternate its impressions, which in the simplest form change from dark to light, and from light to dark. The eye cannot for a moment remain in a particular state determined by the object it looks upon. On the contrary, it is forced to a sort of opposition, which, in contrasting extreme with extreme, intermediate degree with intermediate degree, at the same time combines these opposite impressions and thus ever tends to a whole, whether the impressions are successive or simultaneous and confined to one image. 34. Perhaps the peculiarly grateful sensation which we experience in looking at the skillfully treated chiaroscuro of colorless pictures and similar works of art arises chiefly from the simultaneous impression of a whole, which by the organ itself is sought, rather than arrived at, in succession, and which, whatever may be the result, can never be arrested. End of Part 1, Section 2 Recording by Nathan Rosequist of the Art Monastery Project Artmonastery.org Section 5 of Theory of Colours This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Wade, Cambridge, United Kingdom. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Part 1, Section 3. Grey Surfaces and Objects. 35. 
A moderate light is essential to many chromatic experiments. This can be presently obtained by surfaces more or less grey, and thus we have at once to make ourselves acquainted with this simplest kind of middle tint, with regard to which it is hardly necessary to observe that in many cases a white surface in shadow or in a low light may be considered equivalent to a grey. 36. Since a grey surface is intermediate between brightness and darkness, it admits of our illustrating a phenomenon before described, 29, by an easy experiment. 37. Let a black object be held before a grey surface, and let the spectator, after looking steadfastly at it, keep his eyes unmoved while it is taken away. The space it occupied appears much lighter. Let a white object be held up in the same manner. On taking it away, the space it occupied will appear much darker than the rest of the surface. Let the spectator in both cases turn his eyes this way and that on the surface. The visionary images will move in like manner. 38. A grey object on a black ground appears much brighter than the same object on a white ground. If both comparisons are seen together, the spectator can hardly persuade himself that the two greys are identical. We believe this again to be a proof of the great excitability of the retina, and of the silent resistance which every vital principle is forced to exhibit when any definite or immutable state is presented to it. Thus, inspiration already presupposes expiration. Thus, every systole, its diastole. It is the universal formula of life which manifests itself in this, as in all other cases. When darkness is presented to the eye, it demands brightness, and vice versa. It shows its vital energy, its fitness to receive the impression of the object, precisely by spontaneously tending to an opposite state. End of part one, section three. Part 1, Section 4. Dazzling Colourless Objects 39. If we look at a dazzling, altogether colourless object, it makes a strong, lasting impression, and its after-vision is accompanied by an appearance of colour. 40. Let a room be made as dark as possible. Let there be a circular opening in the window shutter about three inches in diameter, which may be closed, or not, at pleasure. The sun, being suffered to shine through this on a white surface, let the spectator from some little distance fix his eyes on the bright circle thus admitted. The hole being then closed, let him look towards the darkest part of the room. A circular image will now be seen to float before him. The middle of this circle will appear bright, colourless, or somewhat yellow but the border will at the same moment appear red. After a time, this red increasing towards the centre covers the whole circle, and at last the bright central point. No sooner, however, is the whole circle red than the edge begins to be blue, and the blue gradually encroaches inwards on the red. When the whole is blue, the edge becomes dark and colourless, this darker edge again slowly encroaches on the blue till the whole circle appears colourless. The image then becomes gradually fainter, and at the same time diminishes in size. Here again we see how the retina recovers itself by a succession of vibrations after the powerful external impression it received. 25, 26. 41. By several repetitions similar in result, I found the comparative duration of these appearances in my own case to be as follows. I looked on the bright circle five seconds, and then, having closed the aperture, saw the coloured visionary circle floating before me. After thirteen seconds it was altogether red. Twenty-nine seconds next elapsed till the whole was blue, and forty-eight seconds till it appeared colourless. By shutting and opening the eye, 
I constantly revived the image so that it did not quite disappear till seven minutes had elapsed. Future observers may find these periods shorter or longer as their eyes may be stronger or weaker. 23. But it would be very remarkable if notwithstanding such variations, a corresponding proportion as to relative duration should be found to exist. 42. But this remarkable phenomenon no sooner excites our attention than we observe a new modification of it. If we receive the impression of the bright circle as before, and then look on a light grey surface in a moderately lighted room, an image again floats before us, but in this instance a dark one. By degrees it is encircled by a green border that gradually spreads inwards over the whole circle, as the red did in the former instance. As soon as this has taken place a dingy yellow appears, and filling the space as the blue did before is finally lost in a negative shade. 43. These two experiments may be combined by placing a black and white plain surface next to each other in a moderately lighted room, and then looking alternately on one and the other as long as the impression of the light circle lasts. The spectator will then perceive at first a red and green image alternately, and afterwards the other changes. After a little practice, the two opposite colours may be perceived at once by causing the floating image to fall on the junction of the two planes. This can be more conveniently done if the planes are at some distance, for the spectrum then appears larger. 44. I happened to be in a forge towards evening at the moment when a glowing mass of iron was placed on the anvil. I had fixed my eyes steadfastly on it, and, turning around, I looked accidentally into an open coal shed. A large red image now floated before my eyes, and as I turned them from the dark opening to the light boards of which the shed was constructed, the image appeared half green, half red, according as it had a lighter or darker ground behind it. I did not at that time take notice of the subsequent changes of this appearance. 45. The after-vision occasioned by a total dazzling of the retina corresponds with that of a circumscribed bright object. The red colour seen by persons who are dazzled with snow belongs to this class of phenomena, as well as the singularly beautiful green colour which dark objects seem to wear after looking long on white paper in the sun. The details of such experiments may be investigated hereafter by those whose young eyes are capable of enduring such trials further for the sake of science. 46. With these examples we may also class the black letters which in the evening light appear red. Perhaps we might insert under the same category the story that drops of blood appeared on the table at which Henry the Fourth of France had seated himself with the Duc de Guise to play at dice. End of section five. Section six of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Wade, Cambridge, United Kingdom. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Part 1, Section 5. Coloured Objects. 47. We have hitherto seen the physiological colours displayed in the after-vision of colourless bright objects, and also in the after-vision of general colourless brightness. We shall now find analogous appearances if a given colour be presented to the eye. In considering this, all that has been hitherto detailed must be present to our recollection. 48. 
the impression of coloured objects remains in the eye like that of colourless ones but in this case the energy of the retina stimulated as it is to produce the opposite colour will be more apparent forty nine let a small piece of bright coloured paper or silk stuff be held before a moderately lighted white surface let the observer look steadfastly on the small coloured object and let it be taken away after a time while his eyes remain unmoved the spectrum of another colour will then be visible on the white plane the coloured paper may be also left in its place while the eye is directed to another part of the white plane the same spectrum will be visible there too for it arises from an image which now belongs to the eye fifty in order at once to see what colour will be evoked by this contrast the chromatic circle plate one figure three may be referred to the colours are here arranged in a general way according to the natural order and the arrangement will be found to be directly applicable in the present case for the colours diametrically opposed to each other in this diagram are those which reciprocally evoke each other in the eye thus yellow demands purple orange blue red green and vice versa thus again all intermediate graduations reciprocally evoke each other the simpler colour demanding the compound and vice versa note c fifty one the cases here under consideration occur oftener than we are aware in ordinary life indeed an attentive observer sees these appearances everywhere while on the other hand the uninstructed like our predecessors consider them as temporary visual defects sometimes even as symptoms of disorders in the eye thus exciting serious apprehensions a few remarkable instances may here be inserted fifty two i had entered an inn towards evening and as a well-favoured girl with a brilliantly fair complexion black hair and a scarlet bodice came into the room i looked attentively at her as she stood before me at some distance in half shadow as she presently afterwards turned away i saw on the white wall which was now before me a black face surrounded with a bright light while the dress of the perfectly distinct figure appeared of a beautiful sea-green. 53. Among the materials for optical experiments there are portraits with colours and shadows exactly opposite to the appearance of nature. The spectator, after having looked at one of these for a time, will see the visionary figure tolerably true to nature this is conformable to the same principles and consistent with experience for in the former instance a negress with a white headdress would have given me a white face surrounded with black in the case of the painted figures however which are commonly small the parts are not distinguishable by every one in the after image fifty four a phenomenon which has before excited attention among the observers of nature is to be attributed i am persuaded to the same cause it has been stated that certain flowers towards evening in summer coruscate become phosphorescent or emit a momentary light some persons have described their observation of this minutely i had often endeavoured to witness it myself and had even resorted to artificial contrivances to produce it on the nineteenth of june seventeen ninety nine late in the evening when the twilight was deepening into a clear night as i was walking up and down the garden with a friend we very distinctly observed a flame-like appearance near the oriental poppy the flowers of which are remarkable for their powerful red colour we approached the place and looked attentively at the flowers but could perceive nothing further till at last by passing and repassing repeatedly while we looked sideways on them we succeeded in renewing the appearance as often as we pleased it proved to be a physiological phenomenon such as others we have described and the apparent coruscation was nothing but the spectrum of the flower in the compensatory blue-green colour in looking directly at a flower 
the image is not produced but it appears immediately as the direction of the eye is altered again by looking sideways on the object a double image is seen for a moment for the spectrum then appears near and on the real object the twilight accounts for the eye being in a perfect state of repose and thus very susceptible and the colour of the poppy is sufficiently powerful in the summer twilight of the longest days to act with full effect and produce a compensatory image i have no doubt these appearances might be reduced to experiment and the same effect produced by pieces of coloured paper those who wish to take the most effectual means for observing the appearance in nature suppose in a garden should fix the eyes on the bright flowers selected for the purpose and immediately after look on the gravel path this will be seen studded with spots of the opposite colour this experiment is practicable on a cloudy day and even in the brightest sunshine for the sunlight by enhancing the brilliancy of the flower renders it fit to produce a compensatory colour sufficiently distinct to be perceptible even in a bright light thus peonies produce beautiful green marigolds vivid blue spectra fifty five as the opposite colour is produced by a constant law in experiments with coloured objects on portions of the retina so the same effect takes place when the whole retina is impressed with a single colour we may convince ourselves of this by means of coloured glasses if we look long through a blue pane of glass everything will afterwards appear in sunshine to the naked eye even if the sky is grey and the scene colourless in like manner in taking off green spectacles we see all objects in a red light every decided colour does a certain violence to the eye and forces the organ to opposition fifty six we have hitherto seen the opposite colours producing each other successively on the retina it now remains to show by experiment that the same effects can exist simultaneously if a coloured object impinges on one part of the retina the remaining portion at the same moment has a tendency to produce a compensatory colour to pursue a former experiment if we look on a yellow piece of paper placed on a white surface the remaining part of the organ has already a tendency to produce a purple hue on the colourless surface in this case the small portion of yellow is not powerful enough to produce this appearance distinctly but if a white paper is placed on a yellow wall we shall see the white tinged with a purple hue fifty seven although this experiment may be made with any colours yet red and green are particularly recommended for it because these colours seem powerfully to evoke each other numerous instances occur in daily experience if a green paper is seen through striped or flowered muslin the stripes or flowers will appear reddish a grey building seen through green palisades appears in like manner reddish a modification of this tint in the agitated sea is also a compensatory colour the light side of the waves appears green in its own colour and the shadowed side is tinged with the opposite hue the different direction of the waves with reference to the eye produces the same effect objects seen through an opening in the red or green curtain appear to wear the opposite hue these appearances will present themselves to the attentive observer on all occasions even to an unpleasant degree fifty eight having made ourselves acquainted with the simultaneous exhibition of these effects in direct cases we shall find that we can also observe them by indirect means if we place a piece of paper of a bright orange colour on the white surface we shall after looking intently at it scarcely perceive the compensatory colour on the rest of the surface but when we take the orange paper away and when the blue spectrum appears in its place immediately as this spectrum becomes fully apparent the rest of the surface will overspread as if by a flash with a reddish yellow light thus exhibiting to the spectator in a lively manner the productive energy of the organ 
in constant conformity with the same law. 59. As the compensatory colours easily appear where they do not exist in nature near and after the original opposite ones, so they are rendered more intense when they happen to mix with a similar real hue. In a court which was paved with grey limestone flags between which grass had grown, the grass appeared of an extremely beautiful green when the evening clouds threw a scarcely perceptible reddish light on the pavement in an opposite case we find in walking through meadows where we see scarcely anything but green the stems of trees and the roads often gleam with a reddish hue this tone is not uncommon in the works of landscape painters especially those who practise in water colours they probably see it in nature and thus unconsciously imitating it their colouring is criticised as unnatural. 60. These phenomena are of the greatest importance, since they direct our attention to the laws of vision, and are a necessary preparation for future observations on colours. They show that the eye especially demands completeness, and seeks to eke out the colorific circle in itself. The purple or violet colour suggested by yellow contains red and blue. Orange, which corresponds to blue, is composed of yellow and red. Green, uniting blue and yellow, demands red. And so, through all graduations of the most complicated combinations. That we are compelled in this case to assume three leading colours has already been remarked by other observers. 61. When in this completeness the elements of which it is composed are still appreciable by the eye, the result is justly called harmony. We shall subsequently endeavour to show how the theory of the harmony of colours may be deduced from these phenomena, and how, simply through these qualities, colours may be capable of being applied to aesthetic purposes. This will be shown when we have gone through the whole circle of our observations, returning to the point End from which we started. Six. Section 7 of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Wade. Cambridge, United Kingdom. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Part 1, Section 6, Coloured Shadows. 62. Before, however, we proceed further, we have yet to observe some very remarkable cases of the vivacity with which the suggested colours appear in the neighbourhood of others. We allude to coloured shadows. To arrive at these, we first turn our attention to shadows that are colourless or negative. 63. A shadow cast by the sun in its full brightness on a white surface gives us no impression of colour. It appears black, or, if a contrary light, here assumed to differ only in a degree, can act upon it, it is only weaker, half-lightened grey. 64. Two conditions are necessary for the existence of coloured shadows. First, that the principal light tinge the white surface with some hue. Secondly, that a contrary light illuminate to a certain extent the cast shadow. 65. Let a short lighted candle be placed at twilight on a sheet of white paper. Between it and the declining daylight, let a pencil be placed upright, so that its shadow thrown by the candle may be lighted, but not overcome by the weak daylight. The shadow will appear of the most beautiful blue. 66. That this shadow is blue is immediately evident, but we can only persuade ourselves by some attention that the white paper acts as a reddish yellow, by means of which the complemental blue is excited in the eye. 67. In all coloured shadows, therefore, we must presuppose a colour excited or suggested by the hue of the surface on which the shadow is thrown. This may easily be found to be the case by attentive consideration. 
but we may convince ourselves at once by the following experiment. 68. Place two candles at night opposite each other on a white surface. Hold a thin rod between them upright so that two shadows be cast by it. Take a coloured glass and hold it before one of the lights so that the white paper appear coloured. At the same moment, the shadow cast by the coloured light and slightly illumined by the colourless one will exhibit the complemental hue. 69. An important consideration suggests itself here, to which we shall frequently have occasion to return. Colour itself is a degree of darkness. Skipov. Hence, Kircher is perfectly right in calling it lumen opacatum. As it is allied to shadow, so it combines readily with it. It appears to us readily in and by means of shadow, the moment a suggesting cause presents itself. We could not refrain from adverting at once to a fact which we propose to trace and develop hereafter. 70. Select the moment in twilight when the light of the sky is still powerful enough to cast a shadow, which cannot be entirely effaced by the light of a candle. The candle may be so placed that a double shadow shall be visible, one from the candle towards the daylight, and another from the daylight towards the candle. If the former is blue, the latter will appear orange-yellow. This orange-yellow is in fact, however, only the yellow-red light of the candle diffused over the whole paper, and which becomes visible in shadow. 71. This is best exemplified by the former experiment with two candles and coloured glasses. The surprising readiness with which shadow assumes a colour will again invite our attention in the further consideration of reflections and elsewhere. 72. Thus the phenomena of coloured shadows may be traced to their cause without difficulty. Henceforth, let any one who sees an instance of the kind observe only with what hue the light surface on which they are thrown is tinged. Nay, the colour of the shadow may be considered as a chromatoscope of the illuminated surface. For the spectator may always assume the colour of the light to be the opposite of that of the shadow, and by an attentive examination may ascertain this to be the fact in every instance. 73. These appearances have been a source of great perplexity to former observers, for, as they were remarked chiefly in the open air, where they commonly appear blue, they were attributed to a certain inherent blue or blue colouring quality in the air. The inquirer can, however, convince himself by the experiment with the candle in a room that no kind of blue light or reflection is necessary to produce the effect in question. The experiment may be made on a cloudy day with white curtains drawn before the light, and in a room where no trace of blue exists, and the blue shadow will be only so much the more beautiful. 74. De Saussure, in the description of his ascent of Mont Blanc, says, A second remark, which may not be uninteresting, relates to the colour of the shadows. These, notwithstanding the most attentive observation, we never found dark blue, although this had been frequently the case in the plain. On the contrary, in fifty-nine instances we saw them once yellowish, six times pale bluish, eighteen times colourless or black, and thirty-four times pale violet. Some natural philosophers suppose that these colours arise from accidental vapours diffused in the air, which communicate their own hues to the shadows. Not that the colours of the shadows are occasioned by the reflection of any given sky colour or interposition of any given air colour. The above observations seem to favour this opinion. The instances given by de Saussure may now be explained and classed with analogous examples without difficulty. At a great elevation the sky was generally free from vapours. The sun shone in full force on the snow so that it appeared perfectly white to the eye. In this case they saw the shadows quite colourless. If the air was charged with a certain degree of vapour, in consequence of which the light snow would assume a yellowish tone, the shadows were violet coloured, and this effect, it appears, occurred oftenest. They saw also bluish shadows, but this happened less frequently, 
and that the blue and violet were pale was owing to the surrounding brightness by which the strength of the shadows was mitigated once only they saw the shadow yellowish in this case as we have already seen the shadow is cast by a colourless light and slightly illuminated by a coloured one seventy five in travelling over the hearts in winter i happened to descend from the brocken towards evening the wide slopes extended above and below me from the heath every insulated tree projecting rock and all masses of both were covered with snow or hoar-frost the sun was sinking towards the odour ponds during the day owing to the yellowish hue of the snow shadows tending to violet had already been observable these might now be pronounced to be decidedly blue as the illumined parts exhibited a yellow deepening to orange but as the sun at last was about to set and its rays greatly mitigated by the thicker vapours began to diffuse a most beautiful red colour over the whole scene around me the shadow colour changed to a green in lightness to be compared to a sea green in beauty to the green of the emerald the appearance became more and more vivid one might have imagined oneself in a fairy world for every object had clothed itself in the two vivid and so beautifully harmonizing colours till at last as the sun went down the magnificent spectacle was lost in a grey twilight and by degrees in a clear moon and starlight night seventy six one of the most beautiful instances of coloured shadows may be observed during the full moon the candle light and moonlight may be contrived to be exactly equal in force both shadows may be exhibited with equal strength and clearness so that both colours balance each other perfectly a white surface being placed opposite the full moon and the candle being placed a little on one side at a due distance an opaque body is held before the white plane a double shadow will then be seen that cast by the moon and illumined by the candle light will be a powerful red yellow and contrariwise that cast by the candle and illumined by the moon will appear of the most beautiful blue the shadow composed of the union of the two shadows where they cross each other is black the yellow shadow cannot perhaps be exhibited in a more striking manner the immediate vicinity of the blue and the interposing black shadow make the appearance more agreeable it will even be found if the eye dwells long on these colours that they mutually evoke and enhance each other the increasing red in the one still producing its contrast viz a kind of sea green seventy seven we are here led to remark that in this and in all cases a moment or two may perhaps be necessary to produce the complemental colour the retina must be first thoroughly impressed with the demanding hue before the responding one can be distinctly observable seventy eight when divers are under water and the sunlight shines into the diving bell everything is seen in a red light the cause of which will be explained hereafter while the shadows appear green the very same phenomenon which i observed on a high mountain is presented to others in the depths of the sea and thus nature throughout is in harmony with herself seventy nine some observations and experiments which equally illustrate what has been stated with regard to coloured objects and coloured shadows may be added here let a white paper blind be fastened inside the window on a winter evening in this blind let there be an opening through which the snow of some neighbouring roof can be seen towards dusk let a candle be brought into the room the snow seen through the opening will then appear perfectly blue because the paper is tinged with warm yellow by the candle light the snow seen through the aperture is here equivalent to a shadow illumined by a contrary light and may also represent a grey disc on a coloured surface eighty another very interesting experiment may conclude these examples if we take a piece of green glass of some thickness and hold it so that the window bars be reflected in it they will appear double owing to the thickness of the glass the image which is reflected from under the surface of the glass will be green the image which is reflected from the upper surface and which should be colourless will appear red the experiment 
may be very satisfactorily made by pouring water into a vessel, the inner surface of which can act as a mirror, for both reflections may first be seen colourless while the water is pure, and then by tinging it they will exhibit two opposite hues. End of section 7 Recording by Deborah Wade Section 8 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kieran Metz. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 8 Faint Lights. 81 light in its full force appears purely white and it gives this impression also in its highest degree of dazzling splendor light which is not so powerful can also under various conditions remain colorless several naturalists and mathematicians have endeavored to measure its degrees lambert bouguet and rumford eighty two yet an appearance of color presently manifests itself in fainter lights for in their relation to absolute light, they resemble the colored spectra of dazzling objects. 83. A light of any kind becomes weaker, either when its own force from whatever cause is diminished, or when the eye is so circumstanced or placed that it cannot be sufficiently impressed by the action of the light. Those appearances, which may be called objective, come under the head of physical colors. We will only advert here to the transition from white to red heat in glowing iron. We may also observe that the flames of lights at night appear redder in proportion to their distance from the eye. 84. Candlelight at night acts as yellow when seen near. We can perceive this by the effect it produces on other colors. At night, a pale yellow is hardly to be distinguished from white. Blue approaches to green and rose color to orange. 85. Candlelight at twilight acts powerfully as a yellow light. This is best proved by the purple-blue shadows which, under these circumstances, are evoked by the eye. 86. The retina may be so excited by a strong light that it cannot perceive fainter lights. If it perceive these, they appear colored. Hence, candlelight by day appears reddish, thus resembling, in its relation to fuller light, the spectrum of a dazzling object. Nay, if at night we look long and intently on the flame of a light, it appears to increase in redness. 87. There are faint lights which, notwithstanding their moderate luster, give an impression of a white, or, at the most, of a light yellow appearance on the retina, such as the moon in its full splendor. Rotten wood has even a kind of bluish light. All this will hereafter be the subject of further remarks. 88. If at night we place a light near a white or grayish wall, so that the surface be illumined from this central point to some extent, we find on observing the spreading light at some distance that the boundary of the illumined surface appears to be surrounded with a yellow circle, which on the outside tends to red-yellow. We thus observe that when light direct or reflected does not act in its full force, it gives an impression of yellow, of reddish, and lastly, even of red. Here we find the transition to halos, which we are accustomed to see in some mode or other round luminous points. Part 8. Subjective Halos 89. Halos may be divided into subjective and objective. The latter will be considered under the physical colors. The first only belong here. These are distinguished from the objective halos by the circumstance of their vanishing when the point of light which produces them on the retina is covered. 90. We have before noticed the impression of a luminous object on the retina and seen that it appears larger, but the effect is not at an end here. It is not confined to the impression of the image. An expansive action also takes place, spreading from the center. 91. 
that a nimbus of this kind is produced round the luminous image in the eye may be best seen in a dark room if we look towards a moderately large opening in the window shutter in this case the bright image is surrounded by a circular misty light i saw such a halo bounded by a yellow and yellow-red circle on opening my eyes at dawn on an occasion when i passed several nights in a bed carriage ninety two halos appear most vivid when the eye is susceptible from having been in a state of repose a dark background also heightens their appearance both causes account for our seeing them so strong if a light is presented to the eyes on waking at night these conditions were combined when descartes after sleeping as he sat in a ship remarked such a vividly colored halo round the light ninety three a light must shine moderately, not dazzle, in order to produce the impression of a halo in the eye. At all events, the halos of dazzling lights cannot be observed. We see a splendor of this kind round the image of the sun reflected from the surface of water. 94. A halo of this description, attentively observed, is found to be encircled towards its edge with a yellow border. But even here, the expanse of action, before alluded to, is not at an end, but appears still to extend in varied circles. 95. Several cases seem to indicate a circular action of the retina, whether owing to the round form of the eye itself and its different parts, or to some other cause. 96. If the eye is pressed only in a slight degree from the inner corner, darker or lighter circles appear at night even without pressure we can sometimes perceive a succession of such circles emerging from or spreading over each other ninety seven we have already seen that a yellow border is apparent round the white space illumined by a light placed near it this may be a kind of objective halo ninety eight subjective halos may be considered as the result of a conflict between the light and a living surface from the conflict between the exciting principle and the excited an undulating motion arises which may be illustrated by a comparison with the circles on water the stone thrown in drives the water in all directions the effect attains a maximum it reacts and being opposed continues under the surface the effect goes on culminates again and thus the circles are repeated if we have ever remarked the concentric rings which appear in a glass of water on trying to produce a tone by rubbing the edge if we call to mind the intermitting pulsations in the reverberations of bells we shall approach a conception of what may take place on the retina when the image of a luminous object impinges on it not to mention that as a living and elastic structure it has already a circular principle in its organization. 99. The bright circular space which appears round the shining object is yellow, ending in red, then follows a greenish circle which is terminated by a red border. This appears to be the usual phenomenon where the luminous body is somewhat considerable in size. These halos become greater the more distant we are from the luminous object. 100. Halos may, however, appear extremely small and numerous when the impinging image is minute, yet powerful in its effect. The experiment is best made with a piece of gold leaf placed on the ground and illumined by the sun. In these cases, the halos appear in variegated rays. The iridescent appearance produced in the eye when the sun pierces through the leaves of trees seems also to belong to the same class of phenomena. End of section eight. Recording by Kieran Metz. Section nine of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kieran Metz. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 9. Pathological Colors. Appendix 101. 
We are now sufficiently acquainted with the physiological colors to distinguish them from the pathological. We know what appearances belong to the eye in a healthy state and are necessary to enable the organ to exert its complete vitality and activity. 102. Morbid phenomena indicate in like manner the existence of organic and physical laws. For if a living being deviates from those rules with reference to which it is constructed, it still seeks to agree with the general vitality of nature in conformity with general laws, and throughout its whole course still proves the constancy of those principles on which the universe has existed, and by which it is held together. 103. We will here first advert to a very remarkable state in which the vision of many persons is found to be. As it presents a deviation from the ordinary mode of seeing colors, it might be fairly classed under morbid impressions. But as it is consistent in itself, as it often occurs, may extend to several members of a family, and probably does not admit of cure, we may consider it as bordering only on the nosological cases, and therefore place it first. 104. I was acquainted with two individuals not more than 20 years of age who were thus affected. Both had bluish-gray eyes, an acute sight for near and distant objects, by daylight and candlelight, and their mode of seeing colors was in the main quite similar. 105. They agreed with the rest of the world in denominating white, black, and gray in the usual manner. Both saw white untinged with any hue. One saw a somewhat brownish appearance in black, and in gray a somewhat reddish tinge. In general, they appeared to have a very delicate perception of the gradations of light and dark. 106. They appeared to see yellow, red-yellow, and yellow-red like others. In the last case, they said they saw the yellow passing as it were over the red as if glazed. Some thickly ground carmine which had dried in a saucer, they called red. 107. But now a striking difference presented itself. If the carmine was passed thinly over the white saucer, they would compare the light color thus produced to the color of the sky and call it blue. If a rose was shown them beside it, they would, in like manner, call it blue. And in all the trials which were made, it appeared that they could not distinguish light blue from rose color. They confounded rose color, blue, and violet on all occasions. These colors only appeared to them to be distinguished from each other by delicate shades of lighter, darker, intenser, or fainter appearance. 108. Again, they could not distinguish green from dark orange, nor, more especially, from a red-brown. 109. If anyone, accidentally conversing with these individuals, happened to question them about surrounding objects, their answers occasioned the greatest perplexity, and the interrogator began to fancy his own wits were out of order. With some method we may, however, approach to a nearer knowledge of the law of this deviation from the general law. 110. These persons, as may be gathered from what has been stated, saw fewer colors than other people. Hence arose the confusion of different colors. They called the sky rose color and the rose blue, or vice versa. The question now is, did they see both blue or both rose color? Did they see green-orange or orange-green? 111. This singular enigma appears to solve itself if we assume that they saw no blue, but instead of it, a light pure red, a rose color. We can comprehend what would be the result of this by means of the chromatic diagram. 112. If we take away blue from the chromatic circle, we shall miss violet and green as well. Pure red occupies the place of blue and violet, and, in again mixing with yellow, the red produces orange where green should be. 113. Professing to be satisfied with this mode of explanation, we have named this remarkable deviation from ordinary vision a cyanoblepsia. We have prepared some colored figures for its further elucidation, and in explaining these we shall add some further details. Among the examples will be found a landscape colored in the mode in which the individuals alluded to appear to see nature, the sky rose color, and all that should be green varying from yellow to brown red, 
nearly as foliage appears to us in autumn. 114. We now proceed to speak of morbid and other extraordinary affections of the retina, by which the eye may be susceptible of an appearance of light without external light, reserving for a future occasion the consideration of galvanic light. 115. If the eye receives a blow, sparks seem to spread from it. In some states of body, again, when the blood is heated and the system much excited, if the eye is pressed first gently and then more and more strongly, a dazzling and intolerable light may be excited. 116. If those who have been recently couched experience pain and heat in the eye, they frequently see fiery flashes and sparks. These symptoms last sometimes for a week or fortnight, or till the pain and heat diminish. 117. A person suffering from earache saw sparks and balls of light in the eye during each attack, as long as the pain lasted. 118. Persons suffering from worms often experience extraordinary appearances in the eye, sometimes sparks of fire, sometimes specters of light, sometimes frightful figures, which they cannot by an effort of the will cease to see. Sometimes these appearances are double. 119. Hypochondriacs frequently see dark objects such as threads, hairs, spiders, flies, wasps. These appearances also exhibit themselves in the incipient hard cataract. Many see semi-transparent small tubes, forms like wings of insects, bubbles of water of various sizes which fall slowly down if the eye is raised. Sometimes these congregate together so as to resemble the spawn of frogs. Sometimes they appear as complete spheres, sometimes in the form of lenses. 120. As light appeared in the former instances without external light, so also these images appear without corresponding external objects. The images are sometimes transient, sometimes they last during the patient's life. Color, again, frequently accompanies these impressions. For hypochondriacs often see yellow-red stripes in the eye. These are generally more vivid and numerous in the morning or when lasting. 121. We have before seen that the impression of any object may remain for a time in the eye. This we have found to be a physiological phenomenon. The excessive duration of such an impression, on the other hand, may be considered as morbid. 122. The weaker the organ, the longer the impression of the image lasts. The retina does not so soon recover itself, and the effect may be considered as a kind of paralysis. 123. This is not to be wondered at in the case of dazzling lights. If anyone looks at the sun, he may retain the image in his eyes for several days. Boyle relates an instance of 10 years. 124. The same takes place in a certain degree with regard to objects that are not dazzling. Bush relates of himself that the image of an engraving complete in all its parts was impressed on his eye for 17 minutes. 125. A person inclined to fullness of blood retained the image of a bright red calico with white spots many minutes in the eye, and saw it float before everything like a veil. It only disappeared by rubbing the eye for some time. 126. Scherfer observes that the red color, which is the consequence of a powerful impression of light, may last for some hours. 127. As we can produce an appearance of light on the retina by pressure on the eyeball, so by a gentle pressure a red color appears, thus corresponding with the afterimage of an impression of light. 128. Many sick persons, on awaking, see everything in the color of the morning sky, as if through a red veil. So, if in the evening they doze and wake again, the same appearance presents itself. It remains for some minutes and always disappears if the eye is rubbed a little. Red stars and balls sometimes accompany the impression. This state may last for a considerable time. 129. The aeronauts, particularly Zambacari and his companions, 
relate that they saw the moon blood red at the highest elevation as they had ascended above the vapors of the earth through which we see the moon and sun naturally of such a color it may be suspected that this appearance may be classed with the pathological colors the senses namely may be so influenced by an unusual state that the whole nervous system and particularly the retina may sink into a kind of inertness and inexcitability hence it is not impossible that the moon might act as a very subdued light and thus produce the impression of the red color the sun even appeared blood red to the aeronauts of hamburg if those who are at some elevation in a balloon scarcely hear each other speak may not this too be attributed to the inexcitable state of the nerves as well as to the thinness of the air 130 objects are often seen by sick persons in variegated colors Boyle relates an instance of a lady who, after a fall by which an eye was bruised, saw all objects, but especially white objects, glittering in colors, even to an intolerable degree. 131. Physicians give the name of croupsia to an affection of the sight occurring in typhoid maladies. In these cases, the patients state that they see the boundaries of objects colored where light and dark meet. A change probably takes place in the humors of the eye, through which their achromatism is affected. 132. In cases of milky cataract, a very turbid crystalline lens causes the patient to see a red light. In a case of this kind, which was treated by the application of electricity, the red light changed by degrees to yellow and at last to white when the patient again began to distinguish objects. These changes of themselves warranted the conclusion that the turbid state of the lens was gradually approaching the transparent state. We shall be enabled easily to trace this effect to its source as soon as we become better acquainted with the physical colors. 133. If again it may be assumed that a jaundiced patient sees through an actually yellow-colored humor, we are at once referred to the Department of Chemical Colors, and it is thus evident that we can only thoroughly investigate the chapter of pathological colors when we have made ourselves acquainted with the whole range of the remaining phenomena. What has been adduced may therefore suffice for the present till we resume the further consideration of this portion of our subject. 134. In conclusion, we may, however, at once advert to some peculiar states or dispositions of the organ. There are painters who, instead of rendering the colors of nature, diffuse a general tone, a warm or cold hue, over the picture. In some, again, a predilection for certain colors displays itself, in others a want of feeling for harmony. 135. Lastly, it is also worthy of remark that savage nations, uneducated people, and children have a great predilection for vivid colors, that animals are excited to rage by certain colors, that people of refinement avoid vivid colors in their dress and the objects that are about them, and seem inclined to banish them altogether from their presence. End of section 9. Recording by Kieran Metz. Section 10 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karen Almeida, Bern, Switzerland. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 10. Part 2. Physical Colors. 136. We give this designation to colors which are produced by certain material mediums. These mediums, however, have no color themselves, and may be either transparent, semi-transparent, yet transmitting light, or altogether opaque. The colors in question are thus produced in the eye through such external given causes, or are merely reflected to the eye when by whatever means they are already produced without us. Although we thus ascribe to them a certain objective character, their distinctive quality still consists in their being transient and not to be arrested. 137. They are called by former investigators 
colores apparentes, fluxi, fugitivi, fantastici, falsi, variantes. They are also called speziosi and emphatici on account of their striking splendor. They are immediately connected with the physiological colors and appear to have but little more reality. For while in a production of the physiological colors the eye itself was chiefly efficient, and we could only perceive the phenomena thus evoked within ourselves, but not without us, we have now to consider the fact that colors are produced in the eye by means of colorless objects that we thus too have a colourless surface before us which is acted upon as the retina itself is and that we can perceive the appearance produced upon it without us in such a process however every observation will convince us that we have to do with colours in a progressive and mutable but not in a final or complete state one thirty eight hence in directing our attention to these physical colors we find it quite possible to place an objective phenomenon beside a subjective one and often by means of the union of the two successfully to penetrate farther into the nature of the appearance one thirty nine thus in the observations by which we become acquainted with the physical colors the eye is not to be considered as acting alone nor is the light ever to be considered in immediate relation with the eye but we direct our attention especially to the various effects produced by mediums those mediums being themselves colourless one forty light under these circumstances may be affected by three conditions first when it flashes back from the surface of a medium in considering which catoptrical experiments invite our attention secondly when it passes by the edge of a medium the phenomena thus produced were formerly called perioptical we prefer the term paroptical thirdly when it passes through either a merely light transmitting or an actually transparent body thus constituting a class of appearances on which dioptrical experiments are founded we have called a fourth class of physical colors epoptical as the phenomena exhibit themselves on the colourless surface of bodies under various conditions without previous or actual dye one forty one in examining these categories with reference to our three leading divisions according to which we consider the phenomena of colours in a physiological physical or chemical view we find that the catoptrical colours are closely connected with the physiological the paroptical are already somewhat more distinct and independent the dioptrical exhibit themselves as entirely and strictly physical and as having a decidedly objective character the epoptical although still only apparent may be considered as the transition to the chemical colours one forty two if we were desirous of prosecuting our investigation strictly in the order of nature we ought to proceed according to the classification which has just been made but in didactic treatises it is not of so much consequence to connect as to duly distinguish the various divisions of a subject in order that at last when every single class and case has been presented to the mind the whole may be embraced in one comprehensive view we therefore turn our attention forthwith to the dioptrical class in order at once to give the reader the full impression of the physical colours and to exhibit their characteristics the more strikingly section nine dioptrical colours one forty three colours are called dioptrical when a colourless medium is necessary to produce them the medium must be such that light and darkness can act through it either on the eye or on opposite surfaces it is thus required that the medium should be transparent or at least capable to a certain degree of transmitting light one forty four according to these conditions we divide the dioptrical phenomena into two classes placing in the first those which are produced by means of imperfectly transparent yet light transmitting mediums and in the second such as are exhibited when the medium is in the highest degree transparent End of section ten
Section 11 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karen Almeida, Bern, Switzerland. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 11. Section 10. Dioptrical Colors of the First Class. 145. Space, if we assume it to be empty, would have the quality of absolute transparency to our vision. If this space is filled so that the eye cannot perceive that it is so, there exists a more or less material transparent medium, which may be of the nature of air and gas, may be fluid or even solid. 146. The pure and light-transmitting semi-transparent medium is only in the accumulated form of the transparent medium. It may, therefore, be presented to us in three modes. 147. The extreme degree of this accumulation is white, the simplest, brightest, first opaque occupation of space. 148. Transparency itself, empirically considered, is already the first degree of the opposite state. The intermediate degrees from this point to opaque white are infinite. 149. At whatever point short of opacity we arrest the thickening medium, it exhibits simple and remarkable phenomena when placed in relation with light and darkness. 150. The highest degree of light, such as that of the sun, of phosphorus burning in oxygen, is dazzling and colorless so the light of the fixed stars is for the most part colorless the light however seen through a medium but very slightly thickened appears to us yellow if the density of such a medium be increased or if its volume become greater we shall see the light gradually assume a yellow-red hue which at last deepens to a ruby color one fifty one if on the other hand darkness is seen through a semi-transparent medium which is itself illumined by a light striking on it a blue color appears this becomes lighter and paler as the density of the medium is increased but on the contrary appears darker and deeper the more transparent the medium becomes in the least degree of dimness short of absolute transparency always supposing a perfectly colorless medium this deep blue approaches the most beautiful violet One fifty two if this effect takes place in the eye as here described and may thus be pronounced to be subjective it remains further to convince ourselves of this by objective phenomena for a light thus mitigated and subdued illumines all objects in like manner with a yellow yellow red or red hue and although the effect of darkness through the non-transparent medium does not exhibit itself so powerfully yet the blue sky displays itself in the camera obscura very distinctly on white paper as well as every other material color one fifty three in examining the cases in which this important leading phenomenon appears we naturally mention the atmospheric colors first most of these may be here introduced in order one fifty four the sun seen through a certain degree of vapor appears with a yellow disk the center is often dazzlingly yellow when the edges are already red the orb seen through a thick yellow mist appears ruby red as was the case in seventeen ninety four even in the north the same appearance is still more decided owing to the state of the atmosphere when the shirocco prevails in southern climates the clouds generally surrounding the sun in the latter case are of the same color which is reflected again on all the objects the red hues of morning and evening are owing to the same cause the sun is announced by a red light in shining through a greater mass of vapors the higher he rises the yellower and brighter the light becomes one fifty five if the darkness of infinite space is seen through atmospheric vapors illumined by the daylight the blue color appears on high mountains the sky appears by day intensely blue owing to the few thin vapors that float before the endless dark space as soon as we descend in the valleys the blue becomes lighter till at last in certain regions 
and in consequence of increasing vapours it altogether changes to a very pale blue one fifty six the mountains in like manner appear to us blue for as we see them at so great a distance that we no longer distinguish the local tints and as no light reflected from their surface acts on our vision they are equivalent to mere dark objects which owing to the interposed vapours appear blue one fifty seven so we find the shadowed parts of nearer objects are blue when the air is charged with thin vapours one fifty eight the snow mountains on the other hand at a great distance still appear white or approaching to a yellowish hue because they act on our eyes as brightness seen through atmospheric vapour one fifty nine the blue appearance at the lower part of the flame of a candle belongs to the same class of phenomena if the flame be held before a white ground no blue will be seen but this colour will immediately appear if the flame is opposed to a black ground this phenomenon may be exhibited most strikingly with a spoonful of lighted spirits of wine we may thus consider the lower part of the flame as equivalent to the vapour which although infinitely thin is still apparent before the dark surface it is so thin that one may easily see to read through it on the other hand the point of the flame which conceals objects from our sight is to be considered a self-illuminating body One sixty lastly smoke is also to be considered as a semi-transparent medium which appears to us yellow or reddish before a light ground but blue before a dark one one sixty one if we now turn our attention to fluid mediums we find that water deprived in a very slight degree of its transparency produces the same effects one sixty two the infusion of the lignum nephriticum gilondina linea which formerly excited so much attention is only a semi-transparent liquor which in dark wooden cups must appear blue but held towards the sun in a transparent glass must exhibit a yellow appearance one sixty three a drop of scented water of spirit varnish of several metallic solutions may be employed to give various degrees of opacity to water for such experiments spirit of soap perhaps answers best one sixty four the bottom of the sea appears to divers of a red colour in bright sunshine in this case the water owing to its depth acts as a semi-transparent medium under these circumstances they find the shadows green which is the complemental colour one sixty five among solid mediums the opal attracts our attention first its colours are at least partly to be explained by the circumstance that it is in fact a semi-transparent medium through which sometimes light sometimes dark substrata are visible one sixty six for these experiments however the opal glass vitrum astroides girasol is the most desirable material it is prepared in various ways and its semi-opacity is produced by metallic oxides the same effect is produced also by melting pulverized and calcined bones together with the glass on which account it is also known by the name of fine gloss but prepared in this mode it easily becomes too opaque one sixty seven this glass may be adapted for experiments in various ways it may either be made in a very slight degree non-transparent in which case the light seen through various layers placed one upon the other may be deepened from the lightest yellow to the deepest red or if made originally more opaque it may be employed in thinner or thicker laminae the experiments may be successfully made in both ways in order however to see the bright blue colour the glass should neither be too opaque nor too thick for as it is quite natural that darkness must act weakly through the semi-transparent medium so this medium if too thick soon approaches whiteness one sixty eight panes of glass throw a yellow light on objects through those parts where they happen to be semi-opaque and these same parts appear blue if we look at a dark object through them one sixty nine 
smoke glass may be also mentioned here and is in like manner to be considered as a semi-opaque medium it exhibits the sun more or less ruby-colored and although this appearance may be attributed to the black-brown color of the soot we may still convince ourselves that a semi-transparent medium here acts as if we hold such a glass moderately smoked and lit by the sun on the unsmoked side before a dark object for we shall then perceive a bluish appearance one seventy a striking experiment may be made in a dark room with sheets of parchment if we fasten a piece of parchment before the opening in the window shutter when the sun shines it will appear nearly white by adding a second a yellowish color appears which still increases as more leaves are added till at last it changes to red 171 a similar effect owing to the state of the crystalline lens in milky cataract has been already adverted to 172 having now in tracing these phenomena arrived at the effect of a degree of opacity scarcely capable of transmitting light we may here mention a singular appearance which was owing to a momentary state of this kind a portrait of a celebrated theologian had been painted some years before the circumstance to which we allude by an artist who was known to have considerable skill in the management of his materials the very reverend individual was represented in a rich velvet dress which was not a little admired and which attracted the eye of the spectator almost more than the face the picture however from the effect of the smoke of lamps and dust had lost much of its original vivacity it was therefore placed in the hands of a painter who was to clean it and give it a fresh coat of varnish this person began his operations by carefully washing the picture with a sponge no sooner however had he gone over the surface once or twice and wiped away the first dirt then to his amazement the black velvet dress changed suddenly to a light blue plush which gave the ecclesiastic a very secular though somewhat old-fashioned appearance the painter did not venture to go on with his washing he could not comprehend how a light blue should be the ground of the deepest black still less how he could so suddenly have removed a glazing color capable of converting the one tint to the other at all events he was not a little disconcerted at having spoilt the picture to such an extent nothing to characterize the ecclesiastic remained but the richly curled round wig which made the exchange of a faded plush for a handsome new velvet dress far from desirable meanwhile the mischief appeared irreparable and the good artist having turned the picture to the wall retired to rest with a mind ill at ease but what was his joy the next morning when on examining the picture he beheld the black velvet dress again in its full splendor he could not refrain from again wetting a corner upon which the blue color again appeared and after a time vanished on hearing of this phenomenon i went at once to see the miraculous picture a wet sponge was passed over it in my presence and the change quickly took place i saw a somewhat faded but decidedly light blue plush dress the folds under the arm being indicated by some brown strokes i explained this appearance to myself by the doctrine of the semi-opaque medium the painter in order to give additional depth to his black may have passed some particular varnish over it on being washed this varnish imbibed some moisture and hence became semi-opaque in consequence of which the black underneath immediately appeared blue perhaps those who are practically acquainted with the effect of varnishes may through accident or contrivance arrive at some means of exhibiting this singular appearance as an experiment to those who are fond of investigating natural phenomena notwithstanding many attempts i could not myself succeed in reproducing it one seventy three having now traced the most splendid instances of atmospheric appearances as well as other less striking yet sufficiently remarkable cases 
to the leading examples of semi-transparent mediums we have no doubt that attentive observers of nature will carry such researches further and accustom themselves to trace and explain the various appearances which present themselves in everyday experience on the same principle we may also hope that such investigators will provide themselves with an adequate apparatus in order to place remarkable facts before the eyes of others who may be desirous of information one seventy four we venture once for all to call the leading appearance in question as generally described in the foregoing pages a primordial and elementary phenomenon and we may here be permitted at once to state what we understand by the term one seventy five the circumstances which come under our notice in ordinary observation are for the most part insulated cases which with some attention admit of being classed under general leading facts these again range themselves under theoretical rubrics which are more comprehensive and through which we become better acquainted with certain indispensable conditions of appearances in detail from henceforth everything is gradually arranged under higher rules and laws which however are not to be made intelligible by words and hypotheses to the understanding merely but at the same time by real phenomena to the senses we call these primordial phenomena because nothing appreciable by the senses lies beyond them on the contrary they are perfectly fit to be considered as a fixed point to which we first ascended step by step and from which we may in like manner descend to the commonest case of everyday experience such an original phenomena is that which has lately engaged our attention we see on the one side light brightness on the other darkness obscurity we bring the semi-transparent medium between the two and from these contrasts and this medium the colors develop themselves contrasted in like manner but soon through a reciprocal relation directly tending again to a point of union one seventy six with this conviction we look upon the mistake that has been committed in the investigation of this subject to be a very serious one inasmuch as a secondary phenomenon has been thus placed higher in order the primordial phenomenon has been degraded to an inferior place nay the secondary phenomenon has been placed at the head a compound effect has been treated as simple a simple appearance as compound owing to this contradiction the most capricious complication and perplexity have been introduced into physical inquiries the effects of which are still apparent one seventy seven but when even such a primordial phenomenon is arrived at the evil still is that we refuse to recognize it as such that we still aim at something beyond although it would become us to confess that we are arrived at the limits of experimental knowledge let the observer of nature suffer the primordial phenomena to remain undisturbed in its beauty let the philosopher admit it into his department and he will find that important elementary facts are a worthier basis for further operations than insulated cases opinions and hypotheses End of section eleven. Section twelve of theory of colors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gillian hendry theory of colors by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by charles eastlake section 12 11 dioptrical colors of the second class refraction 178. Dioptrical colours of both classes are closely connected, as will presently appear on a little examination. Those of the first class appeared through semi-transparent mediums. Those of the second class will now appear through transparent mediums. But since every substance, however transparent, may be already considered to partake of the opposite quality, as every accumulation of a medium called transparent proves, 
so the near affinity of the two classes is sufficiently manifest. 179. We will, however, first consider transparent mediums abstractly as such, as entirely free from any degree of opacity, and direct our whole attention to a phenomenon which here presents itself, and which is known by the name of refraction. 180. In treating of the physiological colours, we have already had occasion to vindicate what were formerly called illusions of sight, as the active energies of the healthy and duly efficient eye, and we are now again invited to consider similar instances confirming the constancy of the laws of vision. 181. Throughout nature, as presented to the senses, everything depends on the relation which things bear to each other, but especially on the relation which man, the most important of these, bears to the rest. Hence the world divides itself into two parts, and the human being as subject stands opposed to the object. Thus the practical man exhausts himself in the accumulation of facts, the thinker in speculation, each being called upon to sustain a conflict which admits of no peace and no decision. 182. But still the main point always is whether the relations are truly seen. As our senses, if healthy, are the surest witnesses of external relations, so we may be convinced that in all instances where they appear to contradict reality, they lay the greater and surer stress on true relations. Thus a distant object appears to us smaller, and precisely by this means we are aware of distance. We produced coloured appearances on colourless objects, through colourless mediums, and at the same moment our attention was called to the degree of opacity in the medium. 183. Thus the different degrees of opacity in so-called transparent mediums, nay, even other physical and chemical properties belonging to them, are known to our vision by means of refraction, and invite us to make further trials in order to penetrate more completely by physical and chemical means into those secrets which are already opened to our view on one side. 184. Objects seen through mediums more or less transparent do not appear to us in the place which they should occupy according to the laws of perspective. On this fact, the dioptrical colours of the second class depend. 185. Those laws of vision which admit of being expressed in mathematical formulae are based on the principle that, as light proceeds in straight lines, it must be possible to draw a straight line from the eye to any given object in order that it be seen. If, therefore, a case arises in which the light arrives to us in a bent or broken line, that we see the object by means of a bent or broken line, we are at once informed that the medium between the eye and the object is denser, or that it has assumed this or that foreign nature. 186. This deviation from the law of right-lined vision is known by the general term of refraction, and although we may take it for granted that our readers are sufficiently acquainted with its effects, yet we will here once more briefly exhibit it in its objective and subjective point of view. 187. Let the sun shine diagonally into an empty cubical vessel, so that the opposite side be illuminated, but not the bottom. Let water be then poured into this vessel, and the direction of the light will be immediately altered, for a part of the bottom is shone upon. At the point where the light enters the thicker medium, it deviates from its rectilinear direction, and appears broken. Hence the phenomenon is called the breaking, brechung, or refraction. Thus much of the objective experiment. 188. We arrive at the subjective fact in the following mode. Let the eye be substituted for the sun. Let the sight be directed in like manner diagonally over one side, so that the opposite inner side be entirely seen, while no part of the bottom is visible. On pouring in water, the eye will perceive a part of the bottom, and this takes place without our being aware that we do not see in a straight line, for the bottom appears to us raised, and hence we give the term elevation, cable to the subjective phenomenon. Some points which are particularly remarkable with reference to this will be adverted to hereafter. 189. Were we now to express this phenomenon generally, we might here repeat, in conformity with the view lately taken, that the relation of the objects is changed or deranged. 190. But as it is our intention at present to separate the objective from the subjective appearances, we first express the phenomenon in a subjective form and say 
a derangement or displacement of the object seen or to be seen takes place. 191. But that which is seen without a limiting outline may be thus affected without our perceiving the change. On the other hand, if what we look at has a visible termination, we have an evident indication that a displacement occurs. If, therefore, we wish to ascertain the relation or degree of such a displacement, we must chiefly confine ourselves to the alteration of surfaces with visible boundaries, in other words, to the displacement of circumscribed objects. 192. The general effect may take place through parallel mediums, for every parallel medium displaces the object by bringing it perpendicularly towards the eye. The apparent change of position is, however, more observable through mediums that are not parallel. 193. These latter may be perfectly spherical, or may be employed in the form of convex or concave lenses. We shall make use of all these, as occasion may require, in our experiments. But as they not only displace the object from its position, but alter it in various ways, we shall, in most cases, prefer employing mediums with surfaces not indeed parallel with reference to each other, but still altogether plain, namely prisms. These have a triangle for their base, and may, it is true, be considered as portions of a lens, but they are particularly available for our experiments, inasmuch as they very perceptibly displace the object from its position, without producing a remarkable distortion. 194. And now, in order to conduct our observations with as much exactness as possible, and to avoid all confusion and ambiguity, we confine ourselves at first to subjective experiments, in which, namely, the object is seen by the observer through a refracting medium. As soon as we have treated these in due series, the objective experiments will follow in similar order. End of section 12. Section 13 of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 13. 12. Refraction without the appearance of colour. 195. Refraction can visibly take place without our perceiving an appearance of colour. To whatever extent a colourless or uniformly coloured surface may be altered as to its position by refraction, no colour consequent upon refraction appears within it, provided it has no outline or boundary. We may convince ourselves of this in various ways. 196. Place a glass cube on any larger surface and look through the glass perpendicularly or obliquely. The unbroken surface opposite the eye appears altogether raised, but no colour exhibits itself. If we look at a pure grey or blue sky, or a uniformly white or coloured wall through a prism, the portion of the surface which the eye thus embraces will be altogether changed as to its position, without our therefore observing the smallest appearance of colour. 13. Conditions of the Appearance of Colour 197. Although in the foregoing experiments we have found all unbroken surfaces, large or small, colourless, yet at the outlines or boundaries, where the surface is relieved upon a darker or lighter object, we observe a coloured appearance. 198. Outline as well as surface is necessary to constitute a figure or circumscribed object. We therefore express the leading fact thus. Circumscribed objects must be displaced by refraction in order to the exhibition of an appearance of colour. 199. We place before us the simplest object, a light disc on a dark ground. A. A displacement occurs with regard to this object if we apparently extend its outline from the centre by magnifying it. This may be done with any convex glass, and in this case we see a blue edge. B. 200. We can to appearance contract the circumference of the same light disc towards the centre by diminishing the object. The edge will then appear yellow. C. This may be done with a concave glass, which, however, should not be ground thin like common eyeglasses, but must have some substance. 
In order, however, to make this experiment at once with the convex glass, let a smaller black disc be inserted within the light disc on a black ground. If we magnify the black disc on a white ground with a convex glass, the same result takes place as if we diminished the white disc, for we extend the black outline upon the white, and we thus perceive the yellow edge together with the blue edge. D. 201. These two appearances, the blue and yellow, exhibit themselves in and upon the white. They both assume a reddish hue, in proportion as they mingle with the black. Plate 2. 202. In this short statement, we have described the primordial phenomena of all appearance of colour occasioned by refraction. These undoubtedly may be repeated, varied, and rendered more striking, may be combined, complicated, confused, but after all may be still restored to their original simplicity. 203. In examining the process of the experiment just given, we find that in the one case we have to appearance extended the white edge upon the dark surface, in the other we have extended the dark edge upon the white surface, supplanting one by the other, pushing one over the other. We will now endeavour, step by step, to analyse these and similar cases. 204. If we cause the white disc to move, in appearance, entirely from its place, which can be done effectually by prisms, it will be coloured according to the direction in which it apparently moves, in conformity with the above laws. If we look at the disc A through a prism so that it appear moved to B, the outer edge will appear blue and blue-red, according to the law of the figure B. Figure 1. The other edge being yellow and yellow-red, according to the law of the figure C. Figure 1. For in the first case, the white figure is, as it were, extended over the dark boundary, and in the other case, the dark boundary is passed over the white figure. The same happens if the disc is to appearance moved from A to C, from A to D, and so throughout the circle. 205. As it is with the simple effect, so it is with more complicated appearances. If we look through a horizontal prism, A, B, at a white disc placed at some distance behind it at E, the disc will be raised to F and coloured according to the above law. If we remove this prism and look through a vertical one, C, D, at the same disc, it will appear at H and coloured according to the same law. If we place the two prisms one upon the other, the disc will appear displaced diagonally in conformity with a general law of nature and will be coloured as before, that is, according to its movement in the direction. 206. If we attentively examine these opposite coloured edges, we find that they only appear in the direction of the apparent change of place. A round figure leaves us, in some degree, uncertain as to this. A quadrangular figure removes all doubt. 207. The quadrangular figure, A, moved in the direction AB or AD, exhibits no colour on the sides which are parallel with the direction in which it moves. On the other hand, if moved in the direction AC, parallel with its diagonal, all the edges of the figure appear coloured. 208. Thus, a former position, 203, is here confirmed. Namely, to produce colour, an object must be so displaced that the light edges be apparently carried over a dark surface, the dark edges over a light surface the figure over its boundary, the boundary over the figure. But if the rectilinear boundaries of a figure could be indefinitely extended by refraction, so that figure and background might only pursue their course next, but not over each other, no colour would appear, not even if they were prolonged to infinity. End of section 13「Section 14 of Theory of Colours」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated by Charles Eastlake Section 14 Conditions under which the appearance of colours increases 209. 
we have seen in the foregoing experiments that all appearance of colour occasioned by refraction depends on the condition that the boundary or edge be moved in upon the object itself or the object itself over the ground that the figure should be as it were carried over itself or over the ground and we shall now find that by increased displacement of the object the appearance of colour exhibits itself in a greater degree this takes place in subjective experiments to which for the present we confine ourselves under the following conditions two hundred and ten first if in looking through parallel mediums the eye is directed more obliquely secondly if the surfaces of the medium are no longer parallel but form a more or less acute angle thirdly owing to the increased proportion of the medium whether parallel mediums be increased in size or whether the angle be increased provided it does not attain a right angle fourthly owing to the distance of the eye armed with a refracting medium for the object to be displaced fifthly owing to a chemical property that may be communicated to the glass and which may be afterwards increased in effect two hundred and eleven the greatest change of place short of considerable distortion of the object is produced by means of prisms and this is the reason why the appearance of colour can be exhibited most powerfully through glasses of this form yet we will not in employing them suffer ourselves to be dazzled by the splendid appearances they exhibit but keep the above well-established simple principles calmly in view two hundred and twelve the colour which is outside or foremost in the apparent change of an object by refraction is always the broader and we will henceforth call this a border the colour that remains next the outline is the narrower and this we will call an edge two hundred and thirteen if we move a dark boundary towards a light surface the yellow broader border is foremost and the narrower yellow red edge follows close to the outline if we move a light boundary towards a dark surface the broader violet border is foremost and the narrower blue edge follows two hundred and fourteen if the object is large its centre remains uncoloured its inner surface is then to be considered as unlimited it is displaced but not otherwise altered but if the object is so narrow that under the above conditions the yellow border can reach the blue edge the space between the outlines will be entirely covered with colour if we make this experiment with a white stripe on a black ground the two extremes will presently meet and thus produce green we shall then see the following series of colours yellow red yellow green blue blue red two hundred and fifteen if we place a black band or stripe on white paper the violet border will spread till it meets the yellow red edge in this case the intermediate black is effaced as the intermediate white was in the last experiment and in its stead a splendid pure red will appear the series of colours will now be as follows blue blue red red yellow red yellow two hundred and sixteen the yellow and blue in the first case can by degrees meet so fully that the two colours blend entirely in green and the order will then be yellow red green blue red in the second case under similar circumstances we see only blue red yellow this appearance is best exhibited by refracting the bars of a window when they are relieved on a grey sky two hundred and seventeen in all this we are never to forget that this appearance is not to be considered as a complete or final state but always as a progressive increasing and in many cases controllable appearance thus we find that by the negation of the above five conditions it gradually decreases and at last disappears altogether end of section 14section 15 of theory of colors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 15. Explanation of the foregoing phenomena. 218. Before we proceed further, it is incumbent on us to explain the first tolerably simple phenomenon, and to show its connection with the principles first laid down, in order that the observer of nature may be enabled clearly to comprehend the more complicated appearances that follow. 219. In the first place, it is necessary to remember that we have to do with circumscribed objects. In the act of seeing, generally, it is the circumscribed visible which chiefly invites our observation. And in the present instance, in speaking of the appearance of colour, as occasioned by refraction, the circumscribed visible, the detached object solely occupies our attention. 220. For our chromatic exhibitions we can, however, divide objects generally into primary and secondary. The expressions of themselves denote what we understand by them, but our meaning will be rendered still more plain by what follows. 221. Primary objects may be considered firstly as original, as images which are impressed on the eye by things before it, and which assure us of their reality. To these the secondary images may be opposed as derived images, which remain in the organ when the object itself is taken away. Those apparent after images, which have been circumstantially treated of in the doctrine of physiological colours. 222. The primary images, again, may be considered as direct images which, like the original impressions, are conveyed immediately from the object to the eye. In contradistinction to these, the secondary images may be considered as indirect, being only conveyed to us as it were, at second hand from a reflecting surface. These are the mirrored, or catoptical images, which in certain cases can also become double images. 223. When, namely, the reflecting body is transparent, and has two parallel surfaces, one behind the other. In such a case, an image may be reflected to the eye from both surfaces, and thus arrive double images, inasmuch as the upper image does not quite cover the under one. This may take place in various ways. Let a playing card be held before a mirror. We shall at first see the distinct image of the card, but the edge of the whole card, as well as that of every spot upon it, will be bounded on one side with a border, which is the beginning of the second reflection. This effect varies in different mirrors according to the different thickness of the glass and the accidents of polishing. If a person wearing a white waistcoat with the remaining part of his dress dark stands before certain mirrors, the border appears very distinctly, and in like manner the metal buttons on dark cloth exhibit the double reflection very evidently. 224. The reader who has made himself acquainted with our former descriptions of experiments will the more readily follow the present statement. The window bars reflected by plates of glass appear double, and by increased thickness of the glass, and a due adaptation of the angle of reflection. The two reflections may be entirely separated from each other. So a vase full of water, with a plain mirror-like bottom, reflects any object twice, the two reflections being more or less separated under the same conditions. In these cases it is to be observed that, where the two reflections cover each other, the perfect vivid image is reflected, but where they are separated they exhibit only weak, transparent and shadowy images. 225. If we wish to know which is the under and which the upper image, we have only to take a coloured medium, for then a light object reflected from the under surface is of the colour of the medium, while that reflected from the upper surface presents the complemental colour. With dark objects it is the reverse, hence black and white surfaces may be here also conveniently employed. How easily the double images assume and evoke colours will here again be striking. 226. Thirdly, the primary images may be considered as principal images, while the secondary can be, as it were, annexed to those as accessory images. Such an accessory image produces a sort of double form, except that it does not separate itself from the principal object although it may be said to be always endeavouring to do so. It is with secondary images of this last description that we have to do in prismatic appearances. 227. A surface without a boundary exhibits no appearance of colour when refracted. Whatever is seen must be circumscribed by an outline to produce this effect. 
In other words, a figure, an object, is required. This object undergoes an apparent change of place by refraction. The change is, however, not complete, not clean, not sharp, but incomplete inasmuch as an accessory image only is produced. 228. In examining every appearance of nature, but especially in examining an important and striking one, we should not remain in one spot, we should not confine ourselves to the insulated fact, nor dwell on it exclusively, but look round through all nature to see where something similar, something that has affinity to it, appears, for it is only by combining analogies that we gradually arrive at a whole which speaks for itself, and requires no further explanation. 229. Thus we here call to mind that in certain cases refraction unquestionably produces double images, as is the case in Iceland Spa. Similar double images are also apparent in cases of refraction through large rock crystals, and in other instances, phenomena which have not hitherto been sufficiently observed. 230. But since in the case under consideration the question relates not to double but to accessory images, we refer to a phenomenon already adverted to, but not yet thoroughly investigated. We allude to an earlier experiment in which it appeared that a sort of conflict took place in regard to the retina between a light object and its dark ground, and between a dark object and its light ground. The light object in this case appeared larger, the dark one smaller. 231. By a more exact observation of this phenomenon, we may remark that the forms are not sharply distinguished from the ground, but that they appear with a kind of grey, in some degree coloured edge, in short with an accessory image. If, then, objects seen only with the naked eye produce such effects, what may not take place when a dense medium is interposed? It is not that alone which presents itself to us in obvious operation which produces and suffers effects but likewise all principles that have a mutual relation only of some sort are efficient accordingly, and indeed often in a very high degree. 232. Thus when refraction produces its effect on an object that appears in accessory image next to the object itself, the real form thus refracted seems even to linger behind, as if resisting the change of place, but the accessory image seems to advance, and extends itself more or less in the mode already shown. 233. We also remark that in double images the fainter appear only half substantial, having a kind of transparent evanescent character, just as the fainter shades of double shadows must always appear as half shadows. These latter assume colours easily and produce them readily, the former also, and the same takes place in the instance of accessory images, which, it is true, do not altogether quit the real object, but still advance or extend from it as half-substantial images, and hence can appear coloured so quickly and so powerfully. 234. That prismatic appearance is, in fact, an accessory image we may convince ourselves in more than one mode. It corresponds exactly with the form of the object itself, whether the object be bounded by a straight line or a curve, indented or waving. The form of the accessory image corresponds throughout exactly with the form of the object. 235. Again, not only the form but other qualities of the object are communicated to the accessory image. If the object is sharply relieved from its ground, like white on black, the coloured accessory image in like manner appears in its greatest force. It is vivid, distinct and powerful, but it is most especially powerful when a luminous object is shown on a dark ground which may be contrived in various ways. 236. But if the object is but faintly distinguished from the ground, like grey objects on black or white, or even on each other, the accessory image is also faint, and, when the original difference of tint or force is slight, becomes hardly discernible. 237. The appearances which are observable when coloured objects are relieved on light, dark or coloured grounds are, moreover, well worthy of attention. In this case, a union takes place between the apparent colour of the accessory image and the real colour of the object. A compound colour is the result, which is either assisted and enhanced by the accordance, or neutralised by the opposition of its ingredients. 238. But the common and general characteristics of both the double and accessory image is semi-transparence. The tendency of a transparent medium to become only half-transparent or merely light-transmitting has been before adverted to. 
let the reader assume that he sees within or through such a medium a visionary image, and he will at once pronounce this latter to be a semi-transparent image. 239. Thus the colours produced by refraction may be fitly explained by the doctrine of the semi-transparent mediums. For where dark passes over light, as the border of the semi-transparent accessory image advances, yellow appears, and on the other hand, where a light outline passes over the dark background, blue appears. 240. The advancing foremost colour is always the broader. Thus the yellow spreads over the light with a broad border, but the yellow-red appears as a narrow stripe and is next the dark according to the doctrine of augmentation, as an effect of shade. 241. On the opposite side, the condensed blue is next the edge, while the advancing border, spreading as a thinner veil over the black, produces the violet colour, precisely on the principles before explained in treating of semi-transparent mediums, principles which will hereafter be found equally efficient in many other cases. 242. Since an analysis like the present requires to be confirmed by ocular demonstration, we beg every reader to make himself acquainted with the experiments hitherto adduced, not in a superficial manner, but fairly and thoroughly. We have not placed arbitrary signs before him instead of the appearances themselves. No modes of expression are here proposed for his adoption, which may be repeated for ever without the exercise of thought and without leading any one to think but we invite him to examine intelligible appearances which must be present to the eye and mind in order to enable him clearly to trace these appearances to their origin and to explain them to himself and to others. End of section 15 Section 16 of Theory of Colours This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated by Charles Eastlake Section 16 Decrease of the Appearance of Colour 243 We need only take the five conditions under which the appearance of colour increases in the contrary order, to produce the contrary or decreasing state. It may be as well, however, briefly to describe and review the corresponding modifications which are present to the eye. 244. At the highest point of complete junction of the opposite edges, the colours appear as follows. Yellow-red, blue, green, red, blue-red, yellow. 245. Where the junction is less complete, the appearance is as follows. Yellow-red, blue, yellow, blue-red, green-red, blue, yellow-red, blue-red, yellow. Here, therefore, the surface still appears completely coloured, but neither series is to be considered as an elementary series, always developing itself in the same manner and in the same degrees. On the contrary, they can and should be resolved into their elements, and in doing this we become better acquainted with their nature and character. 246. These elements then are yellow, red, blue, yellow, blue, red, white, black, blue, yellow, red, blue, red, yellow. Here the surface itself, the original object, which has been hitherto completely covered, and, as it were, lost, again appears in the centre of the colours, asserts its right, and enables us fully to recognise the secondary nature of the accessory images which exhibit themselves as edges and borders. 247. We can make these edges and borders as narrow as we please. Nay, we can still have refraction in reserve, after having done away with all appearance of colour at the boundary of the object. Having now sufficiently investigated the exhibition of colour in this phenomenon, we repeat that we cannot admit it to be an elementary phenomenon. On the contrary, we have traced it to an antecedent and a simpler one. We have derived it, in connection with the theory of secondary images, 
from the primordial phenomenon of light and darkness as affected or acted upon by semi-transparent mediums thus prepared we proceed to describe the appearances which refraction produces on grey and coloured objects and this will complete the section of subjective phenomena section seventeen grey objects displaced by refraction two hundred and forty eight hitherto we have confined our attention to black and white objects relieved on respectively opposite grounds as seen through the prism because the coloured edges and borders are most clearly displayed in such cases we now repeat these experiments with grey objects and again find similar results two hundred and forty nine as we called black the equivalent of darkness and white the representative of light so we now venture to say that grey represents half shadow which partakes more or less of light and darkness and thus stands between the two we invite the reader to call to mind the following facts as bearing on our present view two hundred and fifty grey objects appear lighter on a black than on a white ground they appear as a light on a black ground and larger as a dark on a white ground and smaller two hundred and fifty one the darker the grey the more it appears as a faint light on black as a strong dark on white and vice versa hence the accessory images of dark grey on black are faint on white strong so the accessory images of light grey on white are faint on black strong 252. Grey on black, seen through the prism, will exhibit the same appearances as white on black. The edges are coloured according to the same law, only the borders appear fainter. If we relieve grey on white, we have the same edges and borders which would be produced if we saw black on white through the prism. 253. Various shades of grey placed next to each other in gradation will exhibit at their edges either blue and violet only or red and yellow only according as the darker grey is placed over or under two hundred and fifty four a series of such shades of grey placed horizontally next each other will be coloured conformably to the same according as the whole series is relieved on a black or white ground above or below two hundred and fifty five the observer may see the phenomena exhibited by the prism at one glance by enlarging the plate intending to illustrate this section. 256. It is of great importance duly to examine and consider another experiment in which a grey object is placed partly on a black and partly on a white surface, so that the line of division passes vertically through the object. 257. The colours will appear on this grey object in conformity with the usual law, but according to the opposite relation of the light to the dark, and will be contrasted in a line. For as the grey is as a light to the black, so it exhibits the red and yellow above the blue and violet below. Again, as the grey is as a dark to the white, the blue and violet appear above the red and yellow below. This experiment will be found of great importance with reference to the next chapter. End of section 16 Section 17 of Theory of Colours This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated by Charles Eastlake Section 17 18. Coloured Objects Displaced by Refraction 258. An unlimited coloured surface exhibits no prismatic colour in addition to its own hue, thus not at all differing from a black, white or grey surface. To produce the appearance of colour, light and dark boundaries must act on it, either accidentally or by contrivance. Hence, experiments and observations on coloured surfaces, as seen through the prism, can only be made when such surfaces are separated by an outline from another, differently tinted surface. In short, when circumscribed objects are coloured. 
259. All colours, whatever they may be, correspond so far with grey that they appear darker than white and lighter than black. This shade-like quality of colour, skieron, has been already alluded to, at 69, and will become more and more evident. If then we begin by placing coloured objects on black and white surfaces, and examine them through the prism, we shall again have all that we have seen exhibited with grey surfaces. 260. If we displace a coloured object by refraction, there appears, as in the case of colourless objects and according to the same laws, an accessory image. This accessory image retains, as far as colour is concerned, its usual nature, and acts on one side as a blue and blue-red, on the opposite side as a yellow and yellow-red. Hence the apparent colour of the edge and border will be either homogeneous with the real colour of the object, or not so. In the first case, the apparent image identifies itself with the real one, and appears to increase it, while in the second case the real image may be vitiated rendered indistinct, and reduced in size by the apparent image. We proceed to review the cases in which these effects are most strikingly exhibited. 261. If we take a coloured drawing enlarged from the plate, which illustrates this experiment, and examine the red and blue squares placed next each other on a black ground, through the prism, as usual, we shall find that as both colours are lighter than the ground, Similarly coloured edges and borders will appear above and below, at the outlines of both, only they will not appear equally distinct to the eye. 262. Red is proportionally much lighter on black than blue is. The colours of the edges will therefore appear stronger on the red than on the blue, which here acts as a dark grey, but little different from black. 263. The extreme red edge will identify itself with the vermilion colour of the square, which will thus appear a little elongated in this direction, while the yellow border immediately underneath it only gives the red surface a more brilliant appearance, and is not distinguished without attentive observation. 264. On the other hand, the red edge and yellow border are heterogeneous with the blue square, a dull red appears at the edge, and a dull green mingles with the figure, and thus the blue square seems, at a hasty glance, to be comparatively diminished on this side. 265. At the lower outline of the two squares, a blue edge and a violet border will appear, and will produce the contrary effect, for the blue edge, which is heterogeneous with the warm red surface, will vitiate it, and produce a neutral colour so that the red on this side appears comparatively reduced and driven upwards, and the violet border on the black is scarcely perceptible. 266. On the other hand, the blue apparent edge will identify itself with the blue square, and not only not reduce, but extend it. The blue edge and even the violet border next it have the apparent effect of increasing the surface and elongating it in that direction. 267. The effect of homogeneous and heterogeneous edges, as I have now minutely described it, is so powerful and singular that the two squares at the first glance seem pushed out of their relative horizontal position and moved in opposite directions, the red upwards, the blue downwards. But no one who is accustomed to observe experiments in a certain succession, and respectively to connect and trace them, will suffer himself to be deceived by such an unreal effect. 268. A just impression with regard to this important phenomenon will, however, much depend on some nice and even troublesome conditions, which are necessary to produce the illusion in question. Paper should be tinged with vermilion or the best minium for the red square, and with deep indigo for the blue square. The blue and red prismatic edges will then unite imperceptibly with the real surfaces, where they are respectively homogeneous. Where they are not, they vitiate the colours of the squares without producing a very distinct middle tint. The real red should not incline too much to yellow, otherwise the apparent deep red edge above will be too distinct. At the same time, it should be somewhat yellow, otherwise the transition to the yellow border will be too observable. The blue must not be light, 
otherwise the red edge will be visible, and the yellow border will produce a too decided green, while the violet border underneath would not give us the impression of being part of an elongated light blue square. 269. All this will be treated more circumstantially hereafter, when we speak of the apparatus intended to facilitate the experiments connected with this part of our subject. Every inquirer should prepare the figures himself, in order fairly to exhibit this specimen of ocular deception, and at the same time to convince himself that the coloured edges, even in this case, cannot escape accurate examination. 270. Meanwhile, various other combinations, as exhibited in the plate, are fully calculated to remove all doubt on this point in the mind of every attentive observer. 271. If, for instance, we look at a white square, next the blue one, on a black ground, the prismatic hues of the opposite edges of the white, which here occupies the place of the red in the former experiment, will exhibit themselves in their utmost force. The red edge extends itself above the level of the blue almost in a greater degree than was the case with the red square itself in the former experiment. The lower blue edge again is visible in its full force next the white, while on the other hand it cannot be distinguished next the blue square. The violet border underneath is also much more apparent on the white than on the blue. 272. If the observer now compares these double squares, carefully prepared and arranged one above the other, the red with the white, the two blue squares together, the blue with the red, the blue with the white, he will clearly perceive the relations of these surfaces to their coloured edges and borders. 273. The edges and their relations to the coloured surfaces appear still more striking if we look at the coloured squares and a black square on a white ground for in this case the illusion before mentioned ceases altogether, and the effect of the edges is as visible as in any case that has come under our observation. Let the blue and red squares be first examined through the prism. In both, the blue edge now appears above. This edge, homogeneous with the blue surface, unites with it and appears to extend it upwards. Only the blue edge, owing to its lightness, is somewhat too distinct in its upper portion. The violet border underneath it is also sufficiently evident on the blue. The apparent blue edge is, on the other hand, heterogeneous with the red square. It is neutralized by contrast and is scarcely visible. Meanwhile, the violet border, uniting with the real red, produces a hue resembling that of the peach blossom. 274. If thus, owing to the above causes, the upper outlines of these squares do not appear level with each other, the correspondence of the under outlines is the more observable. For since both colours, the red and the blue, are darks compared with the white, as in the former case they were light compared with the black, the red edge with its yellow border appears very distinctly under both. It exhibits itself under the warm red surface in its full force, and under the dark blue nearly as it appears under the black, as may be seen if we compare the edges and borders of the figures placed one above the other on the white ground. 275. In order to present these experiments with the greatest variety and perspicuity, squares of various colours are so arranged that the boundary of the black and white passes through them vertically. According to the laws now known to us, especially in their application to coloured objects, we shall find the squares, as usual, doubly coloured at each edge. Each square will appear to be split in two, and to be elongated upwards or downwards. We may here call to mind the experiment with the grey figure, seen in like manner on the line of division between black and white. 257. 276. A phenomenon was before exhibited, even to illusion, in the instance of a red and blue square on a black ground. In the present experiment, the elongation upwards and downwards of two differently coloured figures is apparent in the two halves of one and the same figure, of one and the same colour. Thus we are still referred to the coloured edges and borders, and to the effects of their homogeneous and heterogeneous relations with respect to the real colours of the objects. 277. 
I leave it to observers themselves to compare the various gradations of coloured squares, placed half on black, half on white, only inviting their attention to the apparent alteration which takes place in contrary directions. For red and yellow appear elongated upwards, if on a black ground, downwards, if on a white. Blue, downwards, if on a black ground, upwards, if on a white. All which, however, is quite in accordance with the diffusely detailed examples above given. 278. Let the observer now turn the figures, so that the before-mentioned squares placed on the line of division between black and white may be in a horizontal series, the black above, the white underneath. On looking at these squares through the prism, he will observe that the red square gains by the addition of two red edges. On more accurate examination, he will observe the yellow border on the red figure, and the lower yellow border upon the white will be perfectly apparent. 279. The upper red edge on the blue square is on the other hand hardly visible. The yellow border next it produces a dull green by mingling with the figure. The lower red edge and the yellow border are displayed in lively colours. 280. After observing that the red figure in these cases appears to gain by an addition on both sides, while the dark blue, on one side at least, loses something, we shall see the contrary effect produced by turning the same figures upside down, so that the white ground be above, the black below. 281. For as the homogeneous edges and borders now appear above and below the blue square, this appears elongated, and a portion of the surface itself seems even more brilliantly coloured. It is only by attentive observation that we can distinguish the edges and borders from the colour of the figure itself. 282. The yellow and red squares, on the other hand, are comparatively reduced by the heterogeneous edges in this position of the figures, and their colours are, to a certain extent, vitiated. The blue edge in both is almost invisible. The violet border appears as a beautiful peach blossom hue on the red, as a very pale colour of the same kind on the yellow. Both the lower edges are green, dull on the red, vivid on the yellow. The violet border is but faintly perceptible under the red, but is more apparent under the yellow. 283. Every inquirer should make it a point to be thoroughly acquainted with all the appearances here adduced, and not consider it irksome to follow out a single phenomenon through so many modifying circumstances. These experiments, it is true, may be multiplied to infinity by differently coloured figures, upon and between differently coloured grounds. Under all such circumstances, however, it will be evident to every attentive observer that coloured squares only appear relatively altered, or elongated, or reduced by the prism, because an addition of homogeneous or heterogeneous edges produces an illusion. The inquirer will now be enabled to do away with this illusion if he has the patience to go through the experiments one after the other, always comparing the effects together and satisfying himself of their correspondence. Experiments with coloured objects might have been contrived in various ways. Why they have been exhibited precisely in the above mode, and with so much minuteness, will be seen hereafter. The phenomena, although formerly not unknown, were much misunderstood, and it was necessary to investigate them thoroughly to render some portions of our intended historical view clearer. 284. In conclusion, we will mention a contrivance by means of which our scientific readers may be enabled to see these appearances distinctly at one view, and even in their greatest splendour. Cut in a piece of pasteboard five perfectly similar square openings of about an inch next each other, exactly in a horizontal line. Behind these openings place five coloured glasses in the natural order, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Let the series thus adjusted be fastened in an opening of the camera obscura, so that the bright sky may be seen through the squares, or that the sun may shine on them. They will thus appear very powerfully coloured. Let the spectator now examine them through the prism, and observe the appearances, already familiar by the foregoing experiments, with coloured objects, namely the partly assisting, partly neutralising effects of the edges and borders. 
and the consequent apparent elongation or reduction of the coloured squares with reference to the horizontal line. The results witnessed by the observer in this case entirely correspond with those in the cases before analysed. We do not therefore go through them again in detail, especially as we shall find frequent occasions hereafter to return to the subject. Footnote The earnestness and pertinacity with which Goethe insisted that the different colours are not subject to different degrees of refrangibility are at least calculated to prove that he was himself convinced on the subject and however extraordinary it may seem, his conviction appears to have been the result of infinite experiments and the fullest ocular evidence. He returns to the question in the controversial division of his work, in the historical part, and again in the description of the plates. In the first he endeavours to show that Newton's experiment with the blue and red paper depends entirely on the colours being so contrived as to appear elongated, or curtailed, by the prismatic borders. If, he says, we take a light blue instead of a dark one, the illusion in the latter case is at once evident. According to the Newtonian theory, the yellow-red, red, is the least refrangible colour, the violet the most refrangible. Why then does Newton place a blue paper instead of a violet next to the red? If the fact were as he states it, the difference in the refrangibility of the yellow-red and violet would be greater than in the case of the yellow-red and blue. But here comes in the circumstance that a violet paper conceals the prismatic borders less than a dark blue paper, as every observer may now easily convince himself, and so on. Polemischer Tile, paragraph 45. Desaguliers, in repeating the experiment, confessed that if the ground of the colours was not black, the effect did not take place so well. Goethe adds, not only not so well, but not at all. Historischer Tile page 459. Lucas of Lutif, one of Newton's first opponents, denied that two differently coloured silks are different in distinctness when seen in the microscope. Another experiment proposed by him to show the unsoundness of the doctrine of various refrangibility was the following, that a tin plate painted with the prismatic colours in stripes be placed in an empty cubicle vessel so that from the spectator's point of view the colours may be just hidden by the rim. On pouring water into this vessel, all the colours become visible in the same degree, whereas it was contended, if the Newtonian doctrine were true, some colours would be apparent before others. Historische Tile, page 434. Such are the arguments and experiments adduced by Goethe on this subject. They have all probably been answered. In his analysis of Newton's celebrated Experimentum Crucis, he shows again that by reversing the prismatic colours, refracting a dark instead of a light object, the colours that are the most refrangible in Newton's experiment become the least so, and vice versa. Without reference to this objection, it is now admitted that the difference of colour is not a test of difference of refrangibility, and the conclusion deduced by Newton is no longer admissible as a general truth that to the same degree of refrangibility ever belongs the same colour, and to the same colour ever belongs the same degree of refrangibility. Brewster's Optics, page 72. End of footnote. End of section 17. Section 18 of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 18. Part 19. Achromatism and Hyperchromatism. 285. Formerly, when much that is regular and constant in nature was considered as mere aberration and accident, the colors arising from refraction were but little attended to and were looked upon as an appearance attributable to particular local circumstances. 286. But after it had been assumed that this appearance of color accompanies refraction at all times, it was natural that it should be considered as intimately and exclusively connected with that phenomenon. The belief obtaining that the measure of the colored appearance was in proportion to the measure of the refraction, and that they must advance, peri passu, with each other. 287. 
if again philosophers ascribe the phenomenon of a stronger or weaker refraction not indeed wholly but in some degree to the different density of the medium as pure atmospheric air air charged with vapors water glass according to their increasing density increase the so-called refraction or displacement of the object so they could hardly doubt that the appearance of color must increase in the same proportion and hence took it for granted in combining different mediums which were to counteract refraction that as long as refraction existed the appearance of color must take place and that as soon as the color disappeared the refraction also must cease two hundred eighty eight afterwards it was however discovered that this relation which was assumed to correspond was in fact dissimilar that two mediums can refract an object with equal power and yet produce very dissimilar colored borders two hundred eighty nine it was found that in addition to the physical principle to which refraction was ascribed a chemical one was also to be taken into the account we propose to pursue this subject hereafter in the chemical division of our inquiry and we shall have to describe the particulars of this important discovery in our history of the doctrine of colors what follows may suffice for the present two hundred ninety in mediums of similar or nearly similar refracting power we find the remarkable circumstance that a greater and lesser appearance of color can be produced by a chemical treatment the greater effect is owing namely to acids the lesser to alkalis if metallic oxides are introduced into a common mass of glass the colored appearance through such glasses becomes greatly increased without any perceptible change of refracting power that the lesser effect again is produced by alkalis may be easily supposed two hundred ninety one those kinds of glass which were first employed after the discovery are called flint and crown glass the first produces the stronger the second the fainter appearance of color two hundred ninety two we shall make use of both these denominations as technical terms in our present statement and assume that the refractive power of both is the same but that flint glass produces the colored appearance more strongly by one-third than the crown glass the diagram plate three figure two may serve in illustration two hundred ninety three a black surface is here divided into compartments for more convenient demonstration let the spectator imagine five white squares between the parallel lines a b and c d the square number one is presented to the naked eye unmoved from its place two hundred ninety four but let the square number two seen through a crown glass prism g be supposed to be displaced by refraction three compartments exhibiting the colored borders to a certain extent again let the square number three seen through a flint glass prism h in like manner be moved downwards three compartments when it will exhibit the colored borders by about a third wider than number two two hundred ninety five again let us suppose that the square number four has like number two been moved downwards three compartments by a prism of crown glass and that then by an oppositely placed prism h of flint glass it has been again raised to its former situation where it now stands two hundred ninety six here it is true the refraction is done away with by the opposition of the two but as the prism h in displacing the square by refraction through three compartments produces colored borders wider by a third than those produced by the prism g so notwithstanding the refraction is neutralized there must be an excess of colored border remaining the position of this color as usual depends on the direction of the apparent motion two hundred four communicated to the square by the prism h and consequently it is the reverse of the appearance in the two squares two and three which have been moved in an opposite direction this excess of color we have called hyperchromatism and from this the achromatic state may be immediately arrived at two hundred ninety seven for assuming that it was the square number five which was removed three compartments from its first supposed place like number two by a prism of crown glass g it would only be necessary to reduce the angle of a prism of flint glass h and to connect it reversed to the prism g 
in order to raise the square number five two degrees or compartments by which means the hyperchromatism of the first case would cease the figure would not quite return to its first position and yet be already colorless the prolonged lines of the united prisms under number five show that a single complete prism remains again we have only to suppose the lines curved and an object glass presents itself such is the principle of the achromatic telescopes two hundred ninety eight for these experiments a small prism composed of three different prisms as prepared in england is extremely well adapted it is to be hoped our own opticians will in future enable every friend of science to provide himself with this necessary instrument part twenty advantages of subjective experiments transition to the objective two hundred ninety nine we have presented the appearances of color as exhibited by refraction first by means of subjective experiments and we have so far arrived at a definite result that we have been enabled to deduce the phenomena in question from the doctrine of semi-transparent mediums and double images three hundred in statements which have reference to nature everything depends on ocular inspection and these experiments are the more satisfactory as they may be easily and conveniently made every amateur can procure his apparatus without much trouble or cost and if he is a tolerable adept in pasteboard contrivances he may even prepare a great part of his machinery himself a few plain surfaces on which black white gray and colored objects may be exhibited alternately on a light and dark background are all that is necessary the spectator fixes them before him examines the appearances at the edge of the figures conveniently and as long as he pleases he retires to a greater distance again approaches and accurately observes the progressive states of the phenomena three hundred one besides this the appearances may be observed with sufficient exactness through small prisms which need not be of the purest glass the other desirable requisites in these glass instruments will however be pointed out in the section which treats of the apparatus footnote this description of the apparatus was never given End footnote. 302 a great advantage in these experiments again is that they can be made at any hour of the day in any room whatever aspect it may have we have no need to wait for sunshine which in general is not very propitious to northern observers objective experiments three hundred three the objective experiments on the contrary necessarily require the sunlight which even when it is to be had may not always have the most desirable relation with the apparatus placed opposite to it sometimes the sun is too high sometimes too low and withal only a short time in the meridian of the best situated room it changes its direction during the observation the observer is forced to alter his own position and that of his apparatus in consequence of which the experiments in many cases become uncertain if the sun shines through the prism it exhibits all inequalities lines and bubbles in the glass and thus the appearance is rendered confused dim and discolored three hundred four yet both kinds of experiments must be investigated with equal accuracy they appear to be opposed to each other and yet are always parallel what one order of experiments exhibits the other exhibits likewise and yet each has its peculiar capabilities by means of which certain effects of nature are made known to us in more than one way three hundred five in the next place there are important phenomena which may be exhibited by the union of subjective and objective experiments the latter experiments again have this advantage that we can in most cases represent them by diagrams and present to view the component relations of the phenomena in proceeding therefore to describe the objective experiments we shall so arrange them that they may always correspond with the analogous subjective examples for this reason too we annex to the number of each paragraph the number of the former corresponding one but we set out by observing generally that the reader must consult the plates that the scientific investigator must be familiar with the apparatus in order that the twin phenomena in one mode or the other may be placed before them end of section eighteen recording by philip gould
Section 19 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 21. Refraction without the appearance of color. 306. 195. 196. That refraction may exhibit its effects without producing an appearance of color is not to be demonstrated so perfectly in objective as in subjective experiments. We have, it is true, unlimited spaces which we can look at through the prism, and thus convince ourselves that no color appears where there is no boundary. But we have no unlimited source of light which we can cause to act through the prism. Our light comes to us from circumscribed bodies, and the sun, which chiefly produces our prismatic appearances, is itself only a small circumscribed luminous object. 307. We may, however, consider every larger opening through which the sun shines, every larger medium through which the sunlight is transmitted and made to deviate from its course, as so far unlimited that we can confine our attention to the center of the surface without considering its boundaries. 308. 197. If we place a large water prism in the sun, a large bright space is refracted upwards by it on the plane intended to receive the image, and the middle of this illumined space will be colorless. The same effect may be produced if we make the experiment with glass prisms having angles of few degrees. The appearance may be produced even through glass prisms whose refracting angle is 60 degrees, provided we place the recipient surface near enough. Section 22. Conditions of the Appearance of Color. 309. 198. Although then the illumined space before mentioned appears indeed refracted and moved from its place, but not colored, yet on the horizontal edges of this space we observe a colored appearance. That here again the color is solely owing to the displacement of a circumscribed object may require to be more fully proved. The luminous body which here acts is circumscribed. The sun, while it shines and diffuses light, is still an insulated object. However small the opening in the lid of a camera obscura be made, still the whole image of the sun will penetrate it. The light which streams from all parts of the sun's disk will cross itself in the smallest opening and form the angle which corresponds with the sun's apparent diameter. On the outside we have a cone narrowing to the orifice. Within this apex spreads again, producing on an opposite surface a round image, which still increases in size in proportion to the distance of the recipient surface from the apex. This image, together with all other objects of the external landscape, appears reversed on the white surface in question in a dark room. 310. How little, therefore, we have here to do with single sun rays, bundles or fasces of rays, cylinders of rays, pencils, or whatever else of the kind may be imagined, is strikingly evident. For the convenience of certain diagrams, the sunlight may be assumed to arrive in parallel lines. But it is known that this is only a fiction, a fiction quite allowable where the difference between the assumption and the true appearance is unimportant. But we should take care not to suffer such a postulate to be equivalent to a fact and proceed to further operations on such a fictitious basis. 311. Let the aperture in the window shutter be now enlarged at pleasure. Let it be made round or square. Nay, let the whole shutter be opened, and let the sun shine into the room through the whole window. The space which the sun illumines will always be larger according to the angle which its diameter makes, and thus even the whole space illumined by the sun through the largest window is only the image of the sun plus the size of the opening. We shall hereafter have occasion to return to this. 312. 199. If we transmit the image of the sun through convex glasses, we contract it towards the focus. In this case, according to the laws before explained, a yellow border and a yellow-red edge must appear when the spectrum is thrown on white paper. But as this experiment is dazzling and inconvenient, it may be made more agreeably with the image of the full moon. On contracting this orb by means of a convex glass, the colored edge appears in the greatest splendor, for the moon transmits a mitigated light in the first instance, and can thus the more readily produce color which to a certain extent accompanies the subduing of light. 
At the same time, the eye of the observer is only gently and agreeably excited. 313, 200. If we transmit a luminous image through concave glasses, it is dilated. Here the image appears edged with blue. 314. The two opposite appearances may be produced by a convex glass simultaneously or in succession. Simultaneously by fastening an opaque disc in the center of the convex glass and then transmitting the sun's image. In this case the luminous image and the black disc within it are both contracted and, consequently, the opposite colors must appear. Again we can present this contrast in succession by first contracting the luminous image towards the focus and then suffering it to expand again beyond the focus when it will immediately exhibit a blue edge. 315-201 Here too what was observed in the subjective experiments is again to be remarked, namely that blue and yellow appear in and upon the white, and that both assume a reddish appearance in proportion as they mingle with the black. 316-202-203 these elementary phenomena occur in all subsequent objective experiments, as they constituted the groundwork of the subjective ones. The process, too, which takes place is the same. A light boundary is carried over a dark surface. A dark surface is carried over a light boundary. The edges must advance, and, as it were, push over each other in these experiments as in the former ones. 317-204 if we admit the sun's image through a larger or smaller opening into the dark room, if we transmit it through a prism so placed that its refracting angle as usual is underneath, the luminous image, instead of proceeding in a straight line to the floor, is refracted upwards on a vertical surface placed to receive it. This is the moment to take notice of the opposite modes in which the subjective and objective refractions of the object appear. 318. If we look through a prism held with its refracting angle underneath at an object above us, the object is moved downwards, whereas a luminous image refracted through the same prism is moved upwards. This, which we here merely mention as a matter of fact for the sake of brevity, is easily explained by the laws of refraction and elevation. 319. The luminous object being moved from its place in this manner, the colored borders appear in the order and according to the laws before explained. The violet border is always foremost, and thus, in objective cases, proceeds upwards, in subjective cases, downwards. 320-205 The observer may convince himself in like manner of the mode in which the appearance of color takes place in the diagonal direction, when the displacement is effected by means of two prisms, as has been plainly enough shown in the subjective example. For this experiment, however, prisms should be procured of few degrees, say about 15. 321, 206, 207. That the coloring of the image takes place here, too, according to the direction in which it moves, will be apparent if we make a square opening of moderate size in a shutter and cause the luminous image to pass through a water prism. The spectrum being moved first in the horizontal and vertical directions, then diagonally the colored edges will change their position accordingly. 322, 208. Whence it is again evident that to produce color the boundaries must be carried over each other, not merely move side by side. End of section 19. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 20 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 23. Conditions of the Increase of Color. 323-209. Here, too, an increased displacement of the object produces a greater appearance of color. 324-210 This increased displacement occurs 1. By a more oblique direction of the impinging luminous object through mediums with parallel surfaces. 2. By changing the parallel form for one more or less acute angled. 3. By increased proportion of the medium. 
whether parallel or acute angled partly because the object is by this means more powerfully displaced partly because an effect depending on the mere mass cooperates four by the distance of the recipient surface from the refracting medium so that the colored spectrum emerging from the prism may be said to have a longer way to travel five when a chemical property produces its effects under all these circumstances this we have already entered into more fully under the head of achromatism and hyperchromatism three hundred twenty five two hundred eleven the objective experiments have this advantage that the progressive states of the phenomenon may be arrested and clearly represented by diagrams which is not the case with the subjective experiments three hundred twenty six we can observe the luminous image after it has emerged from the prism step by step and mark its increasing color by receiving it on a plane at different distances thus exhibiting before our eyes various sections of this cone with an elliptical base again the phenomenon may at once be rendered beautifully visible throughout its whole course in the following manner let a cloud of fine white dust be excited along the line in which the image passes through the dark space the cloud is best produced by fine perfectly dry hair powder the more or less colored appearance will now be painted on the white atoms and presented in its whole length and breadth to the eye of the spectator three hundred twenty seven by this means we have prepared some diagrams which will be found among the plates in these the appearance is exhibited from its first origin and by these the spectator can clearly comprehend why the luminous image is so much more powerfully colored through prisms than through parallel mediums 328 212 at the two opposite outlines of the image an opposite appearance presents itself beginning from an acute angle the appearance spreads as it proceeds further in space according to this angle on one side in the direction in which the luminous image is moved a violet border advances on the dark a narrower blue edge remains in the next outline of the image on the opposite side a yellow border advances into the light of the image itself and a yellow red edge remains at the outline three hundred twenty nine two hundred thirteen here therefore the movement of the dark against the light of the light against the dark may be clearly observed three hundred thirty two hundred fourteen the center of a large object remains long uncolored especially with mediums of less density and smaller angles but at last the opposite borders and edges touch each other upon which a green appears in the center of the luminous image three hundred thirty one two hundred fifteen objective experiments have been usually made with the sun's image an objective experiment with a dark object has hitherto scarcely been thought of we have however prepared a convenient contrivance for this also let the large water prism before alluded to be placed in the sun and let a round pasteboard disc be fastened either inside or outside the colored appearance will again take place at the outline beginning according to the usual law the edges will appear they will spread in the same proportion and when they meet red will appear in the center an intercepting square may be added near the round disc and placed in any direction ad libitum and the spectator can again convince himself of what has been before so often described 332 216 if we take away these dark objects from the prism in which case however the glass is to be carefully clean and hold a rod or a large pencil before the center of the horizontal prism we shall then accomplish the complete immixture of the violet border and the yellow red edge and see only the three colors the external blue and yellow and the central red 333 if again we cut a long horizontal opening in the middle of a piece of pasteboard fastened on the prism and then cause the sunlight to pass through it we shall accomplish the complete union of the yellow border with the blue edge upon the light and only see yellow red green and violet the details of this are further entered into in the description of the plates three hundred thirty four two hundred seventeen the prismatic appearance is thus by no means complete and final when the luminous image emerges from the prism it is then only that we perceive its elements in contrast for as it increases these contrasting elements unite and are at last intimately joined the section of this phenomenon arrested on a plane surface is different at every angle of distance from the prism 
so that the notion of an immutable series of colors or of a pervading similar proportion between them cannot be a question for a moment section twenty four explanation of the foregoing phenomena three hundred thirty five two hundred eighteen as we have already entered into this analysis circumstantially while treating of the subjective experiments as all that was of force there is equally valid here it will require no long details in addition to show that the phenomena which are entirely parallel in the two cases may also be traced precisely to the same sources three hundred thirty six two hundred nineteen that in objective experiments also we have to do with circumscribed images has already been demonstrated at large the sun may shine through the smallest opening yet the image of the whole disk penetrates beyond the largest prism may be placed in the open sunlight yet it is still the sun's image that is bounded by the edges of the refracting surfaces and produces the accessory images of this boundary we may fasten pasteboard with many openings cut in it before the water prism yet we still merely see multiplied images which after having been moved from their place by refraction exhibit colored edges and borders and in these mere accessory images three hundred thirty seven two hundred thirty five in subjective experiments we have seen that objects strongly relieved from each other produce a very lively appearance of color and this will be the case in objective experiments in a much more vivid and splendid degree the sun's image is the most powerful brightness we know hence its accessory image will be energetic in proportion and notwithstanding its really secondary dimmed and darkened character must still be very brilliant the colors thrown by the sunlight through the prism on any object carry a powerful light with them for they have the highest and most intense source of light as it were for their ground three hundred thirty eight that we are warranted in calling even these accessory images semi-transparent thus deducing the appearances from the doctrine of the semi-transparent mediums we will be clear to every one who has followed us thus far but particularly to those who have supplied themselves with the necessary apparatus so as to be enabled at all times to witness the precision and vivacity with which semi-transparent mediums act end of section twenty Recording by Philip Gould. Section 21 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake section twenty one part twenty five decrease of the appearance of color three hundred and thirty nine if we could afford to be concise in the description of the decreasing colored appearance in subjective cases we may here be permitted to proceed with still greater brevity while we refer to the former distinct statement one circumstance only on account of its great importance may be here recommended to the reader's especial attention as a leading point of our whole thesis three hundred and forty the decline of the prismatic appearance must be preceded by its separation by its resolution into its elements at the due distance from the prism the image of the sun being entirely colored the blue and yellow at length mix completely and we see only yellow-red, green, and blue-red. If we bring the recipient surface nearer to the refracting medium, yellow and blue appear again, and we see the five colors with their gradations. At a still shorter distance, the yellow and blue separate from each other entirely. The green vanishes, and the image itself appears, colorless between the colored edges and borders the nearer we bring the recipient surface to the prism the narrower the edges and borders become till at last when in contact with the prism they are reduced to nothing part twenty six gray objects three hundred and forty one 
We have exhibited grey objects as very important to our inquiry in the subjective experiments. They show, by the faintness of the accessory images, that these same images are in all cases derived from the principal object. We wish here, too, to carry on the objective experiments parallel with the others, we may conveniently do this by placing a more or less dull ground glass before the opening through which the sun's image enters. By this means, a subdued image would be produced, which on being refracted would exhibit much duller colors on the recipient plane than those immediately derived from the sun's disk. And thus, even from the intense sun image, only a faint accessory image would appear, proportioned to the mitigation of the light by the glass. This experiment, it is true, will only again and again confirm what is already sufficiently familiar to us. Part 27 Colored Objects 342 there are various modes of producing colored images in objective experiments. In the first place, we can fix colored glass before the opening, by which means a colored image is at once produced. Secondly, we can fill the water prism with colored fluids. Thirdly, we can cause the colors already produced in their full vivacity by the prism to pass through proportionate small openings in a thin plate and thus prepare small circumscribed colors for a second operation. This last mode is the most difficult, for owing to the continual progress of the sun, the image cannot be arrested in any direction at will. The second method has also its inconveniences, since not all colored liquids can be prepared perfectly bright and clear. On these accounts, the first is to be preferred and deserves the more to be adopted because natural philosophers have hitherto chosen to consider the colors produced from the sunlight through the prism, those produced through liquids and glasses, and those which are already fixed on paper or cloth as exhibiting effects equally to be depended on and equally available in demonstration. 343. As it is thus merely necessary that the image should be colored, so the large water prism before alluded to affords us the best means of effecting this. A pasteboard screen may be contrived to slide before the large surfaces of the prism through which, in the first instance, the light passes uncolored. In this screen openings of various forms may be cut in order to produce different images and, consequently, different accessory images. This being done, we need only fix colored glasses before the openings in order to observe what effect refraction produces on colored images in an objective sense. 344. A series of glasses may be prepared in a mode similar to that before described. These should be accurately contrived to slide in the grooves of the large water prism. Let the sun then shine through them, and the colored images refracted upwards will appear bordered and edged, and will vary accordingly. For these borders and edges will be exhibited quite distinctly on some images, and on others will be mixed with the specific color of the glass, which they will either enhance or neutralize. Every observer will be enabled to convince himself here again that we have only to do with the same simple phenomenon so circumstantially described subjectively and objectively. Part 28 A Chromatism and Hypochromatism 345 
It is possible to make the hypochromatic and achromatic experiments objectively as well as subjectively. After what has been already stated, a short description of the method will suffice, especially as we take it for granted that the compound prism before mentioned is in the hands of the observer. 346. Let the sun's image pass through an acute angled prism of few degrees, prepared from crown glass, so that the spectrum be refracted upwards on an opposite surface. The edges will appear colored according to the constant law, namely the violet and blue above and outside, the yellow and yellow-red below and within the image. As the refracting angle of this prism is undermost, let another proportionate prism of flint glass be placed against it, with its refracting angle uppermost. The sun's image will by this means be again moved to its place, where, owing to the excess of the coloring power of the prism of flint glass, it will still appear a little colored and, in consequence of the direction in which it has been moved, the blue and violet will now appear underneath and outside, the yellow and yellow-red above and inside. 347. If the whole image be now moved a little upwards by a proportionate prism of crown glass, the hypochromatism will disappear, the sun's image will be moved from its place and yet will appear colorless. 348. With an achromatic object glass composed of three glasses, this experiment may be made step by step if we do not mind taking out the glasses from their setting. The two convex glasses of crown glass in contracting the sun's image towards the focus the concave glass of flint glass, in dilating the image beyond it, exhibit at the edges the usual colors. A convex glass united with a concave one exhibits the colors according to the law of the latter. If all three glasses are placed together, whether we contract the sun's image towards the focus or suffer it to dilate beyond the focus, Colored edges never appear, and the achromatic effect intended by the optician is, in this case, again attained. 349. But as the crown glass has always a greenish tint, and as a tendency to this hue may be more decided in large and strong object glasses, and under certain circumstances produce the compensatory red, which, however, in repeated experiments with several instruments of this kind did not occur to us, philosophers have resorted to the most extraordinary modes of explaining such a result, and having been compelled, in support of their system, theoretically to prove the impossibility of achromatic telescopes, have felt a kind of satisfaction in having some apparent ground for denying so great an improvement. Of this, however, we can only treat circumstantially in our historical account of these discoveries. End of section 21. Recording by Catherine.